Um, good morning, everybody who is in Pacific Standard Time. Good afternoon, good evening, wherever you look, wherever you're watching us from. Um, I want to welcome everybody to SIARC, um, to the Black Lives Matter Week of Action organized by our students. Um, we are happy um, to be in the background supporting their effort, but it, it totally, it's totally organized and generated for our students. Um, and we are very happy that this is the first one of many, many more to come over the years. So we are incredibly grateful and proud of the, the work that has been done by our students um, to put this event together. Um, I think it's crucial for us to keep learning and listen and educate uh, and take action and change based on what we learn. Um, they cannot be changed without accountability and self-criticality. We, we all have to understand um, the systematic racism that exists in our country, our society, our profession, our discipline, our schools, and what we can do to change it and to change it right away. Um, so for us, it's an, another extraordinary opportunity to keep, as I said, uh, learning and be humble by this. Um, I want to especially thank Babatunde, Majadi, Adejare, and Alimbo um, for this fantastic work that they do, they do and for raising the bar and, and make it really, really interesting as we move forward. They put together an amazing series of speakers and series of conversations that we really hope that our community and our expanded community and our friends and brothers and sisters from everywhere who love architecture and want to make it better to participate in this. So again, I want to thank all of you for being part of this. Um, we, as we said many times, we are committed to make this a lifetime, uh, a lifetime issue for the school, an individual lifetime. So we're looking forward to all the conversations to, to get uh, new ideas, to hear multiple voices and to keep building a better uh, a better path forward for architecture. So without further ado, I will pass it to Tunde and Aline, our host for the whole week. And once again, thank you so much for all what you're doing. Um, thank you. Have a great week and go speed with the event. Thank you so much, Hernan. Um, your support throughout this whole thing has been awesome and we're so excited that we could have this event and have all these amazing speakers come and join us and our faculty and students. Um, the Black Lives Matter Week of Action is a student run event that is held during the first week of February and is dedicated to unapologetic conversations and presentations on black culture, expression and justice. At SciArg, our prestige is based on revolutionary conversations that are direct influence on the educational spectrum and overall discourse of design. As a private institute with global recognition, SIARC has students from over 50 countries, but with less than 3% of the student body being black, there is, there's a deficiency of black culture being included in the development of architectural theory, practice, and design. Our mission as SIARC students is to create a collective platform of speakers and with diverse passions ranging from art to activism, where, discretion, where discussions will greatly reinforce the place for black you guys to be here. Um, and it couldn't be possible without the help of my teammate, uh, Baba Tunde, and pass it on to him now. Welcome everybody to the first day of an amazing week, as well as the first day of Black History Month. Um, we're super excited to bring voices, art, creativity, and, and really engaging discussion um, to a platform that has seen a lot of different and a, a lot of diverse engagement, but very limited on, on um, Black culture and Black perspectives. And as one of very few Black students at SciArc, I'm extremely excited to start creating an environment where we feel comfortable, not only engaging in our own um, culture and our own, in our own perspectives, but even just uh, letting go of the need for code switching and, and um, and the mask that we sometimes have to put on in order to really engage in the level that we want to. So um, without further ado, I will pass it off to our amazing moderator for today, Not Too Fall. 
Hi everyone, I'm Not Too Full, um, SciArc alum and uh, design faculty. Um, I'm super excited to be moderating today's um, event. It feels I feel super lucky to be sort of part of the kickoff, um, especially given that um, this is the first, as Hernan said, um, to, of hopefully many more to come. Um, and I'm looking forward to introducing you to our incredible panelists today. Um, first up, we have Ms. Pascal Sablon, um, architect, activist, organizer. Pascal is the 315th living African-American woman registered as an architect in the United States. Um, as was previously mentioned, you know, the architecture sort of has um, this disparity in terms of the, the level of diversity, um, you know, especially when it comes to licensure. Um, Pascal, in 2020, last year, was voted president-elect of the National Organization of Minority Architects and is the fifth woman to hold that position. Um, I like to think of Pascal as sort of the Stacey Abrams of architecture, right? So she is, and she founded an amazing organization called Beyond the Built. Um, their IG account or Instagram account um, is a platform that is actually sort of community run. So there's, um, it's really sort of focused on uplifting and highlighting um, BIPOC and uh, women designers and architects with sort of weekly IG takeovers. Um, the next one is going to be taken over by Amina Blackshear. I'm looking forward to that. And um, through her organization, she also puts together this uh, great designers library. It's a resource featuring 425 profiles of women and BIPOC designers. Um, and you can sort of find their contact information, read more about their work on their website at beyondthebook.com. Um, she's currently working on a project called See It Loud, um, an application that serves as a crowdsourcing tool um, to identify significant pieces of architecture designed by women and diverse um, people in the design profession. Um, and sort of through that project, there's a plan to engage high school students um, and junior high students, um, something that we're very big on um, at SciArc. I myself and um, Leah Wolfman were part of DID, a, a workshop that uh, SciArc teaches every summer um, for youth outreach and to sort of, um, you know, bring design culture to young students that may not be um, you know, ex as exposed to it. And um, with that, Pascal, um, thank you for being here. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for your most generous introductions. Um, I've never heard all of that before, but you did like half of my presentation. That's amazing. <laughs> Uh, shout out to everyone who really took the opportunity in this time and this platform to create opportunities for us to speak and engage and echo that Black Lives Matter. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen and get the presentation started. And I'm loving the extra five minutes, by the way. I didn't, it was not lost on me. All right. Can you mm -hmm. see that? You all are good? Yes. All right. So um, my name is Pascal Sablon, uh, associate at IJ Associates. Uh, founder and executive director of Beyond the Built Environment, AIA New York Board of Director, uh, AIA National Strategic Planning Committee member, which allowed me to help write the strategic plan that the organization and its members need to follow for the next five years. Um, also the NOMA National Historian and the NOMA National President-elect, um, again, the fifth woman ever to hold that position in the organization's 50-year legacy. Now, part of the reason why I want to talk to you about all these kind of different hats is to kind of speak to you in terms of these are the ways in which I engage our community. Um, but specifically when it comes to restorative justice, uh, the AIA New York as a board of director was being able to be part of the team that write our statement about criminal away from building, designing, constructing places of detention. 
that includes jails, prisons, courthouses, police stations, any places with cages, frankly. Um, and so that's really prob probably one of the strongest steps towards restorative justice that I've taken. But I really want to leverage this time and this opportunity to talk about my loving engagement um, and how I elevate uh, people of color, women, um, and kind of step into those opportunities. So through these organizations, I meet with uh, kids and we have different programs that we participate in, such as Project Pipeline. And as we get these kids excited and, and just amp about the project and about the profession, what happens when they go home and try to do some research? So when you Google the word great architects, Google banner comes up with these um, names and faces, about 50 or so. Um, and kind of panning through them, I realize that there are people from contemporary to really, uh, really back in the day. And how many do you think are women in this very long list? One. And so from contemporary time all the way to Raphael and Michelangelo, only Zaha Hadid has had a significant role in this profession to be labeled a great architect. How many people of color? Nine. How many African-Americans? Zero. Zero. So we're saying from now to when architects were Ninja Turtles, uh, there has been zero African-Americans who've had important contributions to society and only nine minorities. Zaha is clutch. She holds it down in two categories, even though she's not with us anymore, which is crazy. I went to Google headquarters in New York and said, hey, why is this happening when I put in this, uh, this text? And they said, Pascal, frankly, there's not enough content. The list you all is great. That one sentence activated me to push a lot of initiatives. So on your screen, powerful print screening moment, uh, are 40 amazing black architects who've sculpted your built environment that you, are, you don't know of, right? Hopefully you do, but just in case you don't, here are some names to really get familiar and get uh, understand the great impact in the built environment. And so why is that? Uh, when listening to Dr. Adelaide Sanford in an Afrocentric education as a human rights speech, she introduced me to a very important character and a very important figure, Albert Schenker. Albert Schenker was pretty much the president of the Federation of Teachers from 1964 and 1997. Uh, he's highly regarded as this great person because he really tried to work to standardize education on all our public school systems across the nature nation, so that no matter what state you were, the quality of the education was equal. Now, part of his methodology came with this understanding that you needed to erase our culture. So quoted is, let's let, let's let never let the African-American child learn of his or her history, because if they do, they relate more to their ethnicity and they will not become an American. Now, her point, and what I'm, uh, I agree with her argument, is that our education system is plagued with that same mindset. We are not being taught how to document and keep history, and we're also not being taught about us and our legends, hence that Google result. So what I've set up in this presentation is the black and white pages kind of sets up the issue. The yellow pages is what I've done specifically to try to address the issue. And then the cyan pages speaks to what I'm still aspiring to do, because I think it's really important that we don't wait till we accomplish something to talk about it, that we are constantly building a network, a community, a coalition of people who are fighting to dismantle injustice. So it's important that I bring you all into the process so that you're here with me. So say it loud, New York. Say it loud. I'm black and I'm proud. Just for those who didn't get that. Uh, <laughs> is a bright, vibrant, meaningful exhibition. Uh, the concept is to see our faces, hear our voices, feel our impact within the colorful tapestry of our heritage. So see our faces. The labels don't just have our names. It has our headshots. Here are voices. We have video testimonials of these designers speaking about their experience as Black architects and Black leaders. Uh, feel our impact, and that's through our work. Um, and kind of talking about who we are. Uh, that Say it Loud exhibition was invited by the United Nations to be displayed in their visitor center. And with that came the power of the podium. They gave me the ability to speak and uh, talk to the world leaders. I emphasize you cannot be what you cannot see um, and wanted their help in creating a, I literally said national movement. Um, and before I got back to my seat, they were like, we're going to help you make this an international movement. I was like, all right, say less. So in 18, um, AIA had their conference in New York, and I submitted a few panel discussions that were specific about our experiences, ours as in Black architects and designers' experiences. Obviously, they were all rejected for being too bespoke and too finite in terms of the topic. However, I took that no, leveraged the fact that my firm at the time, S9 Architecture, was literally one block away from the Javits Center, um, called the UN and was like, hey, are you done with those boards in that model? Let me get it. And I hosted my own Say It Loud A18 in that space, and I leveraged my network and got AIA to put it in their app. 
And I was able to host my panel discussions, have hundreds of people come over, see the exhibition, and participate in our panel discussion. Therefore, even though you get a no, that doesn't necessarily mean that you need to stop. There's always a way to squeeze a yes out of that. So true to their words, St. Loud United Nations was not playing. We worked for a year to translate our exhibition into eight various languages. And that's how you say, say it loud down the center. And then on March 25th, 2019 was literally say it loud day where professors and students were invited to come to those information centers worldwide to see our work. Now, I cannot tell you the amount of tears that came out of my eyes that day to see how this, my little exhibition in New York had reached such profound uh, distances um, and lives. Um, but it also became the moment where I'm like, I cannot keep elevating the same 22 black designers. We need to make this a traveling activation. So moving forward, every Say It Loud was state specific and elevating women and people of color of that area. Then the following year, guess who got invited to the party? So for A19, I got a nice prime real estate spot for my exhibition. And the president at the time, uh, William J. Bates, made it a point to come over and say it loud. So therefore, you get a no one year proof of purchase, and then you get, a, you get your yes the next time and able to leverage more from there. Say It Loud Pennsylvania um, was actually by far my best and most successful community engagement exhibition. Shout outs to Noma PGH uh, from their selection of the venue to make it a public community so focused place and as well as creating so many programs to activate it. Keynote speakers, panel discussion, networking events, straight up parties, and a youth day. This exhibition was activated and really bled straight through into the community and really elevated these local heroes and legends to their communities. Then Say It Loud Ohio, which happened in March of 2020 at the Caramel House Theater, which is the oldest African-American theater in the country. Totally thought that was Apollo. Apollo was whites only for a minute. Who knew? Here we are. So we got 44 incredible architects and designers that submitted their work. 32 of them submitted videos. And two hours before the uh, exhibition was set to open, governor got on the screen and was like, COVID's crazy all the time. The quarantine shut it all the way down. So only the first 90 people were able to see the exhibition and it shut down. And so this really started to um, resonate with me as well. It's like I needed to pivot in this new time of quarantining and being from being at home. So what are my future aspirations about building the, the awareness of us? Well, I want to publish a series of children's books called Learn, Learn Out Loud, which takes our uh, articulations of our architects in 3D format, have their projects pop up with the words, I can too. So as these kids read these books, they have a self-affirmation of saying that they can because once they start getting into the profession, they will be told that repeatedly that they cannot. Also, as recently as yesterday, I connected with the regional director of the architecture series of Lego, and I'm working to get the projects of women and people of color to be featured in that series as well. Again, we're trying to elevate the identities and the work of us on a just society stage. The namesake of this lecture, I was asked to stand, is because of an experience that I had when uh, studying at the School of Architecture at Pratt. First weekend, went to an architecture history class. Professor asked me and another student to stand in a room about 70 kids. All right, these two will never become architects because they're Black and because they're women. Um, I was shocked in that moment that the professor would have the audacity to say such bold things about me without knowing me, knowing my work and my capacity. Shocked me that my peers took it all as fact and as uh, notes, I guess. And then also it was not lost on me that in a room full of 70 students, only me and one other student filled that criteria. Um, and so when I share this story, usually in public lectures, I ask the audience to stand if they were ever told that they can't because of their gender and race. And guess what, y'all? It doesn't just happen to me. Uh, people are standing in academia settings. People are standing up in professional settings. And that's just another layer of um, in oppression and racism and sexism that happens within our profession. And so that we need to make sure that there's sensitivity training that's happening when it comes to our professors and our school leadership. Um, and then also thinking about the demographics of the students. Um, um, and uh, the, the students and the applications of the numbers and why we've been stuck at 5% for nearly a decade. I also want to know what happened to that missing 2% uh, because only 3% graduate, right? Um, just understanding where they asked to stand in one form or, or another or uh, was just architecture not for them. Um, 
Also thinking about the demographics of the professors, uh, seeing that only 2.5% of us are black. Um, uh, sorry, I'm not a professor, but 2.5% um, are black and 32% are women. I'm not saying that I need to see a black woman professor to be able to learn from, but they have different understandings, values, and ethos that are being taught that all of us as an industry can learn from. And so just being mindful of our lack of representation there, what can we do? There's also the Directory of African American Architects that was started by Bradford Grant and Dennis Mann. Uh, in January of 2020, University of Cincinnati was like, uh, this website no longer serves us. We don't want to continue to support it. Shocking. So I'm feeling that they're regretting this moment, but I, I digress. Um, so for the beginning of next last year, I really pushed to have um, somebody else take it over. We were coming all over the place and we got a lot of no's. So I'm really proud and hyped of Noma National for stepping forward and sponsoring and elevating the directory now. This is where we submit our names to know our numbers. That's how I know that I'm 315. And this is how we're going to keep the industry accountable uh, for the, the diversity and the inclusions that are happening within the profession. So if you're licensed or about to be licensed or working to be licensed, this is the directory that you want to go. And again, that's sequenced by state. Um, and then also understanding that we make up 2.5% of the professors. I not only try to lecture and do a lot of public speaking, but using my uh, NOMA historian hat, I also launched the NOMA Vimeo page. Um, and so with this Vimeo page, it's actually uh, hyperlinked and sourced from the Smithsonian's website. Um, we went from 1,000 views to like 16,000 views. I'm really proud of it. But this is a platform, no paywall, where you're able to see videos of lectures, panel discussions, us talking about things other than justice, equity, inclusion. I digress. Um, but it's, again, a place where you can see and hear of us talk about our values and our ethos is in a way that might be able to be applied to your projects and to the way that you practice in the future. So again, another great resource. If you have any videos or know of anything that you found online that you think are super dope, please share, and I will definitely get it up on that page. Um, and then making it come back full circle, I went back to Pratt and said, listen, we're going to make this right. And so we created the Young Designers Conference where we're able to invite 58 students uh, of Brooklyn to come and learn about architecture. We paired high school students with college students to do a design competition and also started to instill in the idea to the college kids that you are already in a position to mentor. At every step in your career, you're able to pull the next one forward with you um, and really engage them. So taking that moment and a place that told me know and made it a place where we're told, telling 60 students yes was really meaningful and powerful to me. Shout out to Pratt. Also, once we graduate, how do we get y'all jobs? How do we get you meaningfully employed? So this is another community that I think about. Uh, so we have programs such as Crafting the Interview, where we have panel discussions with recruiters, HR leads, people who are in charge of hiring, to see what do they want to see, what do they want to hear, what do they need to experience for them to take you all on, and give us kind of like the hidden secrets and gems that everybody else seems to know but us. We also perform mock interviews and portfolio reviews, again, in, a, in an effort to make sure that we are well prepared to show case and show off how incredibly talented and brilliant you all are. Um, also, the Beyond the Built IG page, we launched in December of 2018. We have not missed a week yet. Super proud of leveraging social media for social change. Every week, a different diverse designer takes it over and shares their experience. It does two things. It, one, starts to make us stretch that muscle and exercise that muscle of putting ourselves out there and controlling the narrative and the voice of what we're saying. Also, it's also diversifying all the paths and all the methods and the ways that we impact the built environment. So if you haven't been following, I highly recommend. It's really dope and it's, it's a great, great uh, platform and I love it. And then uh, after hosting 18 exhibitions with another nine exhibitions planned for this year, uh, I have the Great Diverse Designers Library. Great, because Google said nobody calls us great, right? So <laughs> this library is really where all the content from all these exhibitions get put in. And it's not just our headshot, but it's our work, it's our bio, our product achievements, our contributions in these projects. And this site is uh, sequenced by both alphabetical order and by state. Uh, yes, we are right at this moment, we're at 425 but I see us growing at each and every new exhibition. Again, zero paywall is completely for you all to use and leverage. And it's not just students, but uh, you know, hiring staff, people are looking at it. Uh, developers and people who are looking to hire firms are also looking at it, as well as media publications are looking at it. So it's a really great resources that have been growing really fundamentally, and I'm really proud of it. Um, and so 
after my heartbreak of Say It Loud Ohio, uh, during the quarantine time in May of 2020, I launched the virtual exhibitions. I converted all of my past exhibitions to have a virtual component. So not only do you see the photos of the exhibition, but you now get a thumbnail of everyone featured, a picture of their work, and when you click on it, you get a full profile. So you have the ability to explore the entire um, kind of a catalog of Say It Louds um, at your leisure. Uh, and this is kind of what that virtual exhibition looks like when I launched also a series of virtual exhibitions. This is Say It Loud Tennessee, um, where you're able to kind of see all those who submitted as well as what their web page starts to look like that comes back and funnels back into that library. Um, and I noticed that when I did my Say It Louds, I always waited for a community organization or group to invite me in. Um, which was important because I didn't want to be a helicopter advocate, but it also made it very clear that there was parts of the country that I was never invited. So 2020, I was not playing around. Um, as of this moment, this is the uh, level of representation in our library, both globally and by the states, um, to just make sure that we're represented because we touch all parts of the world and we are doing great and fabulous and important things. Um, our ancestors are our heroes and we are their legacy. And so making room for our experiences. So these are the two titles of those panel discussions that I wanted that AIA 18 said no. Well, here I said yes, and it went amazing. Um, also fighting the force of erasure, uh, moments where people are being edited out of video footage and their full existence in a particular conversation that they technically lead or is being taken out, um, as well as being photographed and being part of panel discussions and when it's being sent to print, all of a sudden fall off the page. So yes, I am very about making sure that we speak to the publications, hold them accountable, not just to curse them out for the fun of cursing out, because that is fun, but also to set a kind of MOU in a way of keeping um, them accountable. I also make it a point to be very visible and visual about my um, lack of inaccurate information that's being put out there. Um, and it's important that we all stay diligent to protect our history, because um, that's also part of the force of erasure. So I am launching the state with media campaign where I'm adding asking media publications, digital and broadcasting to be mindful of a few things and committing to a few things. First, uh, keeping track and reporting publicly the amount of women and people of color that is featured in their publication and increasing it by 5% annually until a minimum of 15% is reached. Pledge to have more content out there that specifically call us great. Yes, yeah, said it great. And if you don't use the G word, that's fine. Use the same vernacular you use to describe my white male counterparts. I also ask them to use their researching and development teams to help find historical content because a lot of my work is really capturing contemporary and currently practicing. And then for use their platform to help educate society about black experiences and how architecture is used to facilitate racism and oppression. Um, and then architecture itself in its concrete contributions is an advocate in how we design projects and spaces to do just that. So there's architecture that's used to oppress. What are examples, Pascal? People ask me all the time. I know y'all know, but just in case. Robert Moses and his low bridges to ensure that the undesirables didn't get to Jones Beach. You have developers and developments that have poor doors and uh, market rate tenants and where affordable housing tenants go into, which is the equivalent of the modern day whites only, coloreds only. Yeah, gentrification, redlining, y'all know. So um, some examples of really important architecture that also speaks to our past and keeping record. And the record doesn't necessarily need to be all you know, rainbows and lilies. It can be talking about the dark past. And the word past is also relative because this museum that speaks to or memorial that speaks to those who are lynched um, is not just capturing what's happening in the past, but very much what's happening in our, in our current lives. Uh, we all had the unfortunate um, opportunity to witness the lynching of George Floyd. And so this is an understanding of how architecture is saying that lynching is not something of the past, but something that's very much for the future and documenting and emboldening those names so that we can learn from them. There's also the National Museum of African American History and Culture. Uh, the first time we've ever asked for this um, museum was back in 1915, and we were told African Americans had not significantly contributed to society to warrant a museum on the mall. So the museum itself is a 100-year advocacy effort. Then it was the design and construction and execution was led by three prominent Black architects. And then on top of that, the project, the museum, is the testimony. It testifies to our contribution to society and puts it in a place where society can learn from that. And then lastly, this is also a structure where we can send our artifacts, where we can send the really important figures and components that we hold dear and have it a place where it is protected and potentially elevated to exhibition uh, when we get there. And then 
How do we continue to embed our heroes into the built environment? Really proud to be part of the team that got West 162nd Street uh, renamed J. Max Bond Jr. Way, another very prolific black architect of New York. Um, and so just making sure that we make sure that we embed us into the built environment as well. Then you have the African Burial Ground National Monument. This is the first project I ever worked on as an intern, uh, where they were excavating for yet another federal building, um, found the remains and starts chucking them out, whistle blew, Howard University came in, studied the site and found remains of kids as small as eight months old to elders as 60 year olds. Um, and what's powerful about this particular monument is that it keeps that history. And on the side of the, the chamber, we actually have a map of downtown Manhattan in the full extent of the African burial ground and the estimated 20,000 African remains uh, that are supposed are, that are uh, buried there. Um, but it also creates this reminder that every building adjacent to this monument has and have excavated, saw our bones, poured their foundation literally on us. So including, including all these federal buildings and City Hall has literally, figuratively, conceptually, really, all the leads you can think about, built on the back and the bones of our ancestors and our heroes. So then we also have Bronx Point, which is a project that I'm working on or was working on, 542 affordable housing uh, projects. The concept of the building is hip hop. Uh, the first brick and mortar hip hop museum is within this project, community facilities, waterfront access, public parkway, community plazas, all embedded into this project because I wanted affordability to have no reflection into the built environment that they deserve, everyone deserves. Ir ir responsible of their economic background, a place that they could be proud and call home. So really dope and excited about Bronx Point. And my aspirations is to continue to replace oppressive monuments with those of our great leaders and community spaces. People used to chuckle when I used to make that slide, but now here we are continuing to dismantle that, those oppressive spaces and really activating and pushing for us to think about what those spaces can be transformed to serve us instead of holding us back. And then lastly, architects as advocates. Um, what is our role in terms of fighting for change, not just in the products that we do, but how we push the profession forward? So there's organizations like the Beverly Willis Architecture Foundation. Beverly Willis, which is like 90 something years old, she made her past developer clients pledge that they wouldn't hire any architecture firms that didn't have women in partner or principal leadership. And by doing so, architecture firms that were used to getting repeat clients uh, couldn't because they didn't have women. So those same firms found the women in their office, moved them up, and not just had them sit in a seat, but actually had to mentor them because partner in principle means you have equity, had to get them prepared. So I think this is a dope method of thinking about changing the profession, not just from encouraging us to change, but also using our clients to change us. And so I'm trying to figure out how I can do the same thing for us. Um, then you have organizations that the National Organization of Minority Architects, NOMA, shout outs to them who've been fighting to dismantle injustice in our profession and advocating for us for over 50 years. And so being a part of any of the programming and becoming a member, I highly encourage and recommend. And then beyond the built environment, my advocacy organization has to remain initiatives. See It Loud, the augmented reality app and camp, which is leveraging the content that I get from my Say It Louds and activating it so that you can see and identify projects in your neighborhood that is designed by women and people of color. Uh, then we have the Say It Loud uh, exhibitions. That's really for professionals and students. Hint, hint, nudge, nudge. Uh, elevating your great work. Um, and then we have Learn Out Loud, which is the children's pop-up book that we spoke to uh, again a little bit earlier. But really just trying to have a series of initiatives that is the um, supporting the full pipeline of our access to the profession. The ultimate measure of a man is not where he stands in the moment of comfort and convenience, but where he stands at the time of challenge and controversy. My favorite MLK quote. Um, so I was asked to stand many, many moons ago, and I'm asking you all to stand with me. Thank you. Thank you so much, Pascal. Um, I think now we have some time for a discussion. I feel like you've ran through so many topics and, and sort of initiatives and things. And um, I guess my first question to you, um, given all the research that you've been doing in architecture, what do you see as um, the gaps between practice education and community in terms of, um, you know, uplifting sort of those three things working together and, and uplifting us? Well, I don't know if it's necessarily gaps, but moments and opportunities of engagement. I think we need to center our education and our practice around community. Um, you know, Whitney M. Young talked about 
you know, architects are great at giving each other awards and patting each other on the back, but are completely irrelevant for the fight for civil rights and justice, right? Um, and I, it's not that there's a mixed conception about architects and their relevance, is that that's the that's the, that's our reputation that we created. Um, and so I think centering both the way we think about architecture from the, the values of ideas and opinions that we welcome into the process is critical and the way we teach and what we elevate as being critical and really profound pieces of architecture and um, impact of the built environment. So if we're elevating this project that is so beautiful, but literally has no ADA compliant stairs for people to activate those spaces, then what are we doing? Why did they get that award? It doesn't value or echo that. Uh, that ethos that we have said is important to us, right? And then also we need to diversify us in, in terms of what we learn about, which is why I'm moving or pushing so hard with the library, why I'm pushing so hard with the Say It Loud exhibitions. It doesn't necessarily need to be just one woman architect out here in the game and one black architect. Like, no, there's like a thousand of us, so stop it. Um, and we're all doing incredible and amazing work. And it's not about convenience of where you can find us, but that we're doing great things. And and so I think if we start to focus our community engagement um, components, put that as part of the curriculum, mm -hmm. right? So whenever I'm on a guest crit and I come in and they're like, oh, I did my site research. I was like, oh, what does that look like? Oh, I went to the site. I took pictures. I got maps. I'm like, okay, but did you ask anybody who was walking by what they wanted to see? Did you engage anyone in the community? Like their voice matters. Um, and then I also echo firms like Concordia out of Louisiana who on their design team has something called a community fellow, which is a paid position for somebody in the community to participate in the design meetings regularly. So it's not a matter of, oh, I gotta go do a community board meeting, blah, blah, blah. No, now it's community is part of the conversation. Right. There, It's a paid position because their voice has value, right? And it's a consistent uh, relationship where they're able to come back and be a two-way conduit of communication between the community that's impacted by our project. And when I say community, I do not just mean client and tenant, but anyone impacted by those projects as well as able to bring forth why, why architects or design team couldn't execute on certain things that they're requesting. Mm -hmm. And by having that really important conversation, it starts to build the trust. And then also we need to be mindful that we don't just go into these communities, opportunities, and just ask and just take, oh, what do you want? What do you this and this? All right, bye. And just like walk away. When they give us feedback that maybe not falls within our purview or the criteria or, or the answers we want to hear, we have the responsibility to take their answers and to put it in a place where action could be uh, taken place and, and push those things forward. So I think honestly, if we start heralding and uh, prioritizing community, society in the design process and the execution of the built environment, um, that will really uh, echo throughout the components and throughout making justice as part of our design uh, process. Yeah. I couldn't agree more. There are a few students here with us. I'm wondering if any of you have any questions for Pascal before um, I ask another one. I just want to give you guys the floor. Don't be shy. Be sure to send it in the chat. Um, um, I guess let's talk more about your organization, Beyond the Built. Um, could you maybe speak to the name? Um, I feel like that, that name sort of carries, um, you know, significance in terms of um, your work and, and this idea of, you know, putting the actual designers um, before the actual, their, their work, you know, sort of highlighting them um, as individuals. Sure. So as I kind of listed all these organizations that I'm a part of, yeah. I'm very much of a fan um, and an advocate for collective responsibility, right? I'm happy to be part of a team from a supporter standpoint, as well as from a leadership standpoint. And usually getting involved in these organizations help me build my network with like-minded, like activated individuals who are fighting for components, but they also help educate me and understand what are the true challenges, who are the real allies, um, and who's paying lip service. Um, and that just kind of opportunity to understand fully the dynamics of what the issues you're trying to dis dismantle is priceless. So I always recommend that you get involved in these organizations. And that's why I said it's, it's beyond just the built environment. It's beyond the, the projects we're drawing and building. It's, it's, it's all of it, it's the entire ecosystem. But in that collective responsibility, you might see or and identify a unique component that isn't being addressed. Not, not because it's not important, 
but we just don't have the capacity for what we're working on. And so that's how Beyond the Built Environment started, um, where I really started to focus it on, we don't elevate ourselves. Why don't I know this? Why do I get my facts about Black architects from IG? Why is that, right? Like I kept, and I would find a project, I'm like, wait, you all did this? This is your project? How do I not know that? Mm -hmm. And also this idea of constantly elevating the single one architect for every project. Y'all know it takes thousands of people to build a project, even if it's just a little kitchen renovation. So these beautiful projects that we're heralding, we keep putting it all on one person. And clearly we're not getting the opportunity to be at the head of these multi-billion dollar developments. So I'm saying, hey, if you've been on a project and you've been on it for two years and your role was residential layouts, then yo, claim it. That's how you impacted the built environment. And who's gonna take that away from you, right? Um, and then also just kind of thinking about that. So beyond the built environment really came forth from seeing a gap um, in what we were focusing on, but then also still leveraging that same community to help me build it, right? Some of the first submissions to my say aloud are people that are, are in those advocacy organizations with me. And every time I put out a shout for like a new say it loud, like today I put out say it loud North Carolina, it's those people who are resharing it, retweeting it, and extending it through their network to help pull people in. Um, so I guess my point is being beyond the built environment is just kind of kind of speaking to the fact that um, our role as architects doesn't just stop at at the drawings. And then lastly, I'll say watching and witnessing protests um, right now is like, how can I protest from home? I needed to quarantine or stay uh, locked down because my kid um, who's four has respiratory challenges. So leaving my house wasn't an option for me. But why do architects only need to step forward when an RFP and an RFQ is dropped? Nah, it's beyond that, right? We have critical thinking skills, leadership skills. We know how to synthesize really complex information in a way that's graphically understandable and legible. Uh, we know our cities, we know what their components are. So why do we wait two, three years or not to get engaged? So when there's a protest, how can I help? Can I, instead of making you watch this video of this black brother getting shot in the chest, can I create a graphic that explains to you where he started running, where he stopped and where he ended and what happened so that you don't get the trauma, but you still get the information? Mm -hmm. How can I leverage all the skill sets that I am taught as an architect in a way to help without it necessarily being architecture? And again, that's what I mean by beyond the built environment. Yeah. Um. I guess, speaking of allies, um, one more question is, what are ways you see individuals and institutions like SciArc, um, or what are ways that you see um, individuals and institutions like SciArc um, uplifting, you know, and, and honoring sort of blackness and the black imaginary within the built environment, um, particularly black spatial imaginaries like already existing or, or that are in the works? I think centering, I mean, few few things. Um, I didn't talk about it today because it was one of my edits, but I had Say It Loud Georgia Tech, um, which was the first school of architecture that allowed me to do a Say It Loud. And having a school of architecture allowing me to do an exhibition solely on women and people of color is a big ask, apparently. And uh, I don't get yeses to that often. So um, if we're going to put the plug, I'll say uh, it'd be great and powerful to elevate us in those spaces and prioritize what we've done to the built environment as part of the education process. Yeah. Also, as I'm working on publishing a book about great architects, right? Um, it's important to know that there's lots of publications and books that are out there that elevate and talk about these issues, values, and ethoses that should be taught. And so kind of helping expand and understand what that means, the different variations of uh, engagement when it comes to Black professionals, as we talked about that 2.5% of professors that are people of color or Black professors specifically, um, and just making sure like how else can we engage, right? And honestly, with Zoom, it allows me to participate and be part of these uh, programs all around the world, even while sitting in a snow blizzard, right? Um, and so how do we continue to reach out to the different uh, communities that we have to pull as much representation forward as humanly possible? Um, but then also make it your business to have examples of projects that students should be referencing that are designed by women and people of color. Um, and not just for those students, but for all of the students. Um, and also, I think it's important that you all be part of the documentation and historic res uh, historical work. Right. You all are incredible researchers. Y'all are team. No sleep. I know it. Um, and leverage some of that energy and power and resources and funding from your school. Right. Get the schools to help fund researches and ways of building wiki pages for people of color. Help create that content 
um, write publications, white pages, request white pages, um, you know, really push push academia. You all, you all are the bosses here, right? right. Um, you all have the power to leverage and push for what you need. And so I think really uh, pushing institutions to A, say, you know what, it's time that we elevate women and people of color, alumna or and alumni even better, right, in these exhibition works. And then it's also about teaching. And then lastly, what we talked about, being asked to stand. Make sure there's a sens sensitivity training that's happening with the professors, because professors can be saying some wild stuff. Make sure that your admissions office also has similar training to ensure that when they're looking at our applications, it doesn't keep getting stuck at 5%. There's a reason. Um, and it's really kind of thinking uh, boldly about it and creating uh, this understanding that you can't manage what you can't measure. Put metrics. I want to see what is the percentages that you're at now? What is the goal that you're striving for? And be public about it. Um, so these are, I'm, I'm all in love with all these statements of solidarity. Very nice. But now I'm about that action. Let me see what we're doing, how we putting in work and how we're getting it done. Right. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. Um, and I think, you know, Sire this summer sort of the students have organized a series of conversations and um you know there was research done by faculty and um you know the school sort of or like working towards um, being more inclusive and, and diverse um but i agree like all, all the things you said you know are, i think it's really important now like we've we've we're sort of at a point where we're beyond just the words and and there needs to be sort of um, actions behind all of those. Um, given that you're working on so many things and and sort of organizing so many things, I would like to know what you're most excited about and invested in in this moment. Um, I will say my new position at AJ Associates, like that, is like just mind blowing. Yeah. heart fulfilling um, because this is the first time where I'll be able to be both an advocate and an architect mm -hmm. during the day. Um, and so a lot of that advocacy work that you saw, all of it, all of it <laughs> happened at night, right? Um, yeah. You know, I had my nine to six and then at six to nine is when I did all these exhibitions and lectures and all that fun jazz. And lectures was typically like my lunch hour and meetings were scheduled right, right at six to make sure that I'm able to push it outside of my work hours and day. So really even just stepping forward into being able to hold this position at a professional, as a position in my position um, description is really powerful and important to me. I'm always shocked and taken aback every time they repost or retweet or we be something me. I'm like, oh man, I've never, I've never done this or had this before. So having that kind of support is critical. Um, also, first time I filled out my timesheet, not first time, but when I opened up the timesheet kind of portal, advocacy is a line item in the timesheets blew my mind. And I know you guys are kind of academia, but I'm telling you right now, usually anything that has to do with advocacy, diversity, inclusion, all that is your volunteer time and not a place where you can kind of allocate hours to. So the fact that they prioritize that it is standard on all timesheets, just like, let me know that I've gotten to a place where I'm home. Um, and so that's really where I'm pouring a lot of my passion. At the same time, leveraging technology to allow me to continue to do the work um, of 10 people <laughs> through like, you know, Wix and kind of portals for things to be submitted through, working with communities and say, look, it can't just be me. Y'all gotta find these people in communities as well to elevate, let's do the programs, let's put it out in press. Um, and the thing I would say that's probably been the most challenging right now is getting the say with media. Mm -hmm. They're all down. They all understand what I'm trying to do, but are very skeptical or hesitant to commit. Um, so if your school has a publication, that's another thing that you might want to say, like, hey, we should look into submitting and committing to making sure that we're elevating and documenting women and people of color mm -hmm. and being accountable to that. Um, so I would say the thing that I'm the most giddy about and pouring a lot of my soul into right now is my position at AJ office. Um, the thing that I'm struggling the most with is the say with media. Mm -hmm. um, and the thing that's probably keeping me up at night the most is probably say it louds just because um, there's just been an insurgence of people who want to do it. And mm -hmm. I want to make sure that we pull it because there was a time where a student group reached out wanted to do a say it loud and the school said, no, they won't fund it. They won't provide the space. Mm -hmm. And um, I fought so hard to make it happen. And I will never forget that these kids were asking for it. The 
professors and the dean were like, nah, it's not important. Um, and so I really want to just get to a place where I can activate and create these say alouds with or without um, support from certain institutions just to ensure that those who need those spaces and that messaging the most receive it. That's great. I'm congratulations. Um, looking forward to sort of seeing all of your work and especially the the see it loud um, app. I know that's still in development. Um, I think that's going to be fantastic. You know, sort of really leveraging um, technology and making that making that information sort of accessible through an app. I think um, is going to be like one of the strongest ways to to reach. You know hundreds of people, um, you know, and I know it's specific for preteens and, and sort of um, high school students, but, you know, I'm going to download, I'm gonna download that too, you know, like just just to, to learn about the community, you know, and, and um, learn about other designers doing things, um, you know, and, and working. And um, I think that, you know, as a, a sort of new faculty member, I'm one of my classes I'm teaching a seminar this semester and we're looking at the history of uh, South Central Los Angeles through um, the jazz scene that came about um, as the black community or neighborhoods um, in Los Angeles developed so um, you know I'm super excited and thank you again for your presentation. Um, thank you. Well, I wanted to just say thank you so much for the the kind of reminder about See It Loud. So the yeah. intent was I have all this content from Say It Loud, like I have 425 designers. Some of those products, most of those products are built, right? Now, how do I make it even more accessible? And so I thought about preteens and teens because they're most likely to have a device, um, honestly, but not necessarily um, going to happen. But what happens if it kind of functions similar to a Pokemon Go where you're able to be in a city and it kind of points to a project down the block or a few blocks away that is designed by women or people of color. And then when you go there, you're able to learn, hear the faces and the names of people who worked on it and created it, as well as get the template for you to be able to draw an a, a art piece inspired by what you see, capture it and see it on your building at one-to-one -one scale. Now, why that's incredibly important and why it's been so challenging while we work on this um, app is because augmented reality wants to be close to you and small mm -hmm. where I want it to be big and far away right and so the fact that I'm mapping it on the building and trying to make sure that your exact location is precise because just being a few feet off will make the whole thing kind of go left right mm -hmm. and so just kind of creating a strategy and how we can mark you in a place where when you create your art and put it up it um it looks what you need it to be and then you can see it in context Right. And the kind of activation of that is really allowing kind of this audacity to all these kids of reimagining and actually having a hand in seeing what they could do. So they'd be like, oh, the building to the left looks a little bit different. Let me add more lines or, or whatnot and just kind of see it in context. Mm -hmm. And then lastly, I think of a lot of our architecture renderings and perspectives, and I am definitely guilty of this as well, is always from this bird's eye, God's eye view um, and really kind of pushing it that we're looking at these projects now from the pedestrian scale actually creates this importance of that ground plane of those public spaces. How does your project meet the ground um, and how does it really pull the community into it as part of that conversation and discussion. So I definitely want to move that green cyan page that y'all didn't see today into the yellows as well. Um, but really just leveraging technology, um, especially right now. And this is something I've been working on for almost two years now. So this is really incredible to see us get so close. And I'm fairly confident we'll be able to launch it this year. Um, and we'll see what we can do about it. And I will definitely say it loud when, when it does. <laughs> Um, I think we have a question from a student and a comment in the chat that I can read after the question. Sure. Kinda, you want to go ahead? Actually, go ahead and read that comment first. Okay. I think that's better than my question. So, Tishifago says, I personally am glad we could have this talk with all these projects already on the roll. But my biggest question is how or what enables you the most to keep all these gears rolling at the same time? Active advocacy, a professional architectural degree, what had to give and what was the key to keep all this going at once? Okay, so this is where y'all are gonna be super disappointed in me. <laughs> because aside from the advocacy and being an architect and an advocate in professional settings and so on and so forth, um, I'm also a mom, um, I'm also a spouse, mm -hmm. and um, you know, I'm a daughter, I'm a, a lot of things. And there's a lot of my identity yeah. that I try to put forth. And um, 
honestly, the thing that had to give was me, right? Uh, you know, my lack of sleep, my lack of self-care, my lack of just focusing inward. Like whenever there's a spare moment, there's so much guilt. Like there's so much guilt when I take a nap. I, I'm like, I'm so disappointed in myself mm. when I take it. I'm disappointed when I wake up and I punish myself by like, all right, you're not sleeping for the next like six days because you need to make up for like you having the audacity to lay down. Right. Um, and it's something that I'm literally actively working on myself to um, allow me to breathe and allow me to function and to prioritize myself. Um, and so always making room to work out every day, trying to eat better, um, but just kind of reassessing. And then I stopped starting with emails with, so sorry for the delay with your patience was appreciated um, and not feeling so responsible to respond to every single email, like super fast. Like I just, I just don't have the capacity to do it. Um, and I also bring all of myself into as many spaces as possible. For instance, I'll go to board meetings. My son, my husband comes with me. If you want me out of my home for more than three days, they're coming with. So conferences, usually the whole salon squad is there with me. I've been known to breastfeed during giving my board report meetings or reports because that's that was his time. Um, also participating, kind of pulling my family is part of the advocacy work that I'm doing. So instead of trying to subdivide me and say, you get five minutes, you get an hour and you get 30 minutes, it's like, all y'all need to just be in here with me at the same time and just play your part as much as you can. So it's something that I'm working towards. And honestly, another reason why the new position at the IJ office is so refreshing because it's one less thing that I need to parsh partial off. Um, it's always also coming during the day. And so that really frees up my nights and weekends to be more engaged with my family. So I, I do not have the... Um, the solution or the answer for that one. It's something that I very honestly am struggling with as well. Yeah, I think, um, I feel like that's a very like, that's a very common behavior feeling as designers. Like we have this sort of pressure we apply on ourselves um, to sort of constantly be producing and productive. You know, I think I I love that you're, you're, you're sort of owning that like, it's still a work in progress, you know, because I can relate. I know so many people can relate. Um, yeah, that's great. But if you figure it out, please let me know. Let you know. <laughs> share, y'all. Share the community. Let, let me know. If there's something else I should be doing, let me know. Um, it's all welcome. Yeah. It, was there one uh, more question, I believe? I, I was just about to ask, is there one more question? Yes. Um, I wanted to let room for other students, but actually this is great because my question kind of is a prequel to what you just spoke on. Um, and it's not so much a question, hopefully just an expansion of, of a thought from you. Um, as, a, as a student who has, you know, so many ambitions and so many um, interests and speaking to someone who's able to um, just function and move in so many different spheres relating to what it is that you want to do. What was that process like from when you started as an architectural student? Um, like what were your like goals at the time? And I know, I know this is like a huge topic. Like I, I don't want you to have to take up too much of your time, but um, just like, can, can you like maybe touch on a little bit like the process of, um, you know, even committing yourself uh, from at the time of being an architectural student to and entering into all of the different positions that you hold now and like what the mindset was um, then to now? Sure. Um, so I always knew I wanted to be an architect. That was my answer when you asked me when I was a kid. Um, that happened when I was commissioned to do an, a mural for a Pamanak Art Community Center uh, across the street from Queens College. Um, and as I was drawing my beautiful multicultural jungle gym, a person walked by and said, wow, you could draw straight lines without a ruler. That's a cool skill for an architect to have. And he kept walking. I was like, architecture, yes, this is perfect. I can use my art, artistic capabilities to change the world. Um, it also wasn't lost on me that had my neighbor or person who walked by didn't have this out loud thought, I don't know when architecture would have been offered to me as a career path. 
And so from 11 to, you know, you know, applying for colleges, it was always about architecture, architecture, architecture. So my goal stepping into Pratt was really just to be the dopest architect in all of the world. Um, and then when seeing um, the experience with the professor, um, that took, that threw me smooth off because I'm from Queens, Cambria Heights specifically, which is a Caribbean heavy, like 99% of us was Haitian, um, where I'm taught and educated about us and how great we are. Then I went to a all girls Catholic preparatory school called Mary Lewis Academy, where again, I was taught about powerful women and how beast we are because we're women and all that we could do. And so for my first week of school to be told that I'm incapable because of two things that were always celebrated just kind of shocked me but also kind of leveled the responsibility of me that I will never just be representing Pascal, right? I'm always carrying the weight of being a woman and a person of color because the man said, she ain't gonna do it because she's black and because she's a woman. Those are the two criteria that made, that invalidated my existence. And when I sat down, the, profess the person next to me said, you better not let that be that reason that makes you stop, right? And so that activated me into a different place. But I'm not gonna lie, every time I didn't wanna go to class or wasn't feeling well, I'm like, no, 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 I can't be the black girl who doesn't show up for class because then what does that do for the next girl behind me or adjacent to me? So that's when that kind of responsibility of, uh, of the purpose of me started to expand beyond just trying to do dope architecture, but really trying to show up and show out every time I come into a space. Um, and then frankly, that's why I got my master's degree at Columbia University, because again in architecture because I needed to make sure that I was overqualified for the position and the role that I wanted to take on because I understood the demographics of the, the firm of the industry. I was able to work at Eris Architects which was a, a minority owned firm, work on the ABG for five years while in school which was incredible and a, and a privilege and also set my trajectory in understanding the responsibility of architecture to teach and to keep sacred and to be an active piece of protest, honestly. Um, and so then when I joined firms like FX Collaborative and S9, I really gravitated to projects that were really heavy for international addressing issues that really start to solve um, society issues and problems that were there. And so that's why I wanted to share like Bronx Point, because I love the fact that like the whole building concept was hip hop. And being in a boardroom and hearing the developer, head developer go, but wait, how is this project really serving the community? Like convince me. And to see that there's people with power that have that kind of mindset really re revived how I could be an advocate architect during the day, during the projects that I'm working on. And then now here at Ajay's uh, office, being able to have, have this role, be representing us in this capacity and being able to communicate with y'all and be in these kind of conversations is also critical, but also being able to soon learn about how they are fighting for design justice in the products that we do and bring that part of these conversations as well. And so I, and I know that you're asking, like you have a lot of tasks, so how do you keep it all going? I think about when I cook that I have all four burners going on at the same time. Sometimes something's on hot, Sometimes I gotta low, slow that down. I just kind of keep moving with the components that I have and I try to leverage the same sauces, if you will, right? My say it loud is my main dish, but that is feeding my see it loud, it's feeding my library, it's feeding my say it with media. And then lastly, I have a singular mission to make uh, architecture, the profession and the built environment more equitable and just. That's the measure, that's the metric everything that I'm requested to be a part of, to have a role of responsibility to, or a project to be part of, always has to measure up against that, that, that metric. And if it doesn't, if it falls short, I got no problem saying, so sorry, not for me, not right now. For, here's the other reasons. And here are 20, 10 other people you could consider for this event or for that position or for that role. Um, so really creating a, a method, a, a filter to ensure that whatever I put my energy towards is, uh, is meaningful and moves the mission forward. And also being fine with saying no doesn't mean that you're not at the table of certain things, but you're creating and allowing for more space and opportunities for the stuff that truly matter to you, for the stuff that really activates your passion to have a space for you to kind of put work into it. And nothing has to happen overnight. Everything takes time, but we're going to get there. Thank you for your question. Thank you for your answer. <laughs> Um, I like to just jump in. Hi, first of all. Um, I'd like to say thank you, first of all, for allowing, well, I guess, okay. 
I'm just thankful for the timing that we are in because I admire speakers that speak when things are going and not just speaking intention and having projects already going on. Um, but I heard you mention something about your growing up Caribbean and surrounded by people that looked like you. And I personally grew up in Africa. Um, when I got to America, I sort of got um, parachuted into American blackness. And that was my sort of awakening that you had in Pratt. Not that I'd had that stand up because thankfully Sayard has been really diverse, but not like <laughs> to blackness. Um, how, I guess my question for you is how would you translate the notion of being parachuted into blackness, like a sudden awareness of your skin color and that it matters to people? How would I translate that? Uh, wow, I don't know if I if I share it. Um, I, I want to say the the experience that most aligns with that is becoming a mother. Um, becoming a mother was by far the hardest thing I've ever done professionally, and honestly, part of the reason why I'm only having one kid because it almost knocked me out of the profession. Um, but I failed to understand or realize the sexism and oppression that is also within the industry um, and also how our built environment fails us as, as mothers in that capacity as well. Um, and so I think my biggest statement or my way of kind of addressing your question is really moving in a place of empathy because you really, you just don't understand. I literally thought all these women who weren't returning back to the office after maternity leave just loved their baby so much that they didn't want to come back didn't realize some wild things are being said, didn't realize that the expectations was unrealistic, didn't realize that they would hit a glass ceiling that would be nearly impossible for them to break, didn't understand and recognize that the only number more abysmal in the profession of architecture in terms of people of color is actually women with children. That's actually crazier numbers, which is insane to me because neither have anything to do with our ability to do architecture fundamentally, right? Um, but I think my point to say is there are other injustices that are happening in the built environment that I'm just completely unaware of, but doesn't mean that the existence of it or that the importance or the rapture of it isn't uh, equally as devastating as the ones that I experience. Um, so when I can, I try to be, I always step into a room as a listener, as an observer to hear um, what are the issues? What are the things that are moving people? What are the things that are oppressing people? And then where I can contribute, but don't assume that I am the leader of all conversations and discussions just because I like to be loud. You'd be surprised. So I guess my point is to say your experience is very unique to you, um, as mine was to me. Um, and I don't know that I can equate it necessarily, um, but really just this kind of shock and awareness that, whoa, this is very different and I had no idea, uh, really took me back to when I had my son, Xavier. Thank you for your powerful question and I'll keep thinking about it. Thank you for trying to answer it. <laughs> Thank you so much, Pascal. Um, Yes, round of applause. Um, you, we appreciate you. you sharing your work with us and, and coming to speak. Um, I think we're gonna shift gears. I wanna introduce our next panelist. Um, I think I wanted to also touch on the sort of theme for the week or, or the, um, not theme for the week, but each day is sort of focusing on a few principles from the Black Lives Matter movement. Um, and so, our next panelist, Kalila Williams, is a student leader, an organizer, a young freedom fighter, uh, truly an inspiration and a force of nature. Um, she is the leader and organizer of the Black Lives Matter Youth Vanguard, as well as an organization um, Students Deserve. Um, she's an advocate for the Defund the Police movement particularly in LAUSD uh, school, the school system, where black students are more likely to receive citations or be stopped by the police at the school than their classmates as um, black people often are um, in society in general. Um, 
She has been recognized in the LA Times, People's Magazine, and has been featured in a PSA with Levi's. So without further ado, Kalila, thanks for being here. Thank you for having me. Um, and also before we shift gears, because you know, these are to two total different presentations from what Pascal shared to what I will be sharing. Um, and also it's, an ama it's amazing to be in a space with all you wonderful people. So um, I wanna thank you for this opportunity. Um, but I also want to recognize that these are new perspectives that I will be talking about. And so this is not something that is gonna fly by easily with everyone or that everybody might be prepared for like, you know, news perspectives, it takes a while to catch on. Um, but I just want you to be prepared to like swift your gears. Um, Cause this, yeah, this is a little different. Um, so I'm going to share my screen. Um, okay, so like, um, <clears throat> Like it was said, like I am a part of Students Deserve as well as Black Lives Matter U Vanguard. We're two youth organizations that work hand in hand um, on working to prioritize Black youth, especially in LAUSD. Um, so we're a coalition um, that, like I said, works to make Black Lives Matter in and beyond schools, uh, particularly with making sure. Um, that we are uh, stopping the criminalization of black students. Um, okay, so yeah, this is just like a few of like the students, it's a youth led organization. So this is all youth led, um, every, um, every rally that is put together, every meeting, everything is hosted by youth as well as organized by youth. So this is just an example of my fam um, who have contributed to this movement. Um, so some of our major victories, a lot of people like um, a lot of people ask, like, what have you guys done? So back in um, 2019, these are some of just our recent victories. Um, in June, we ended the racist policy that targeted Black youth and invaded their privacy. This was made possible by direct action and organizing the ending random searches campaign. Um, so random searches was this racist policy, as I said, that targeted black youth where they would be searched um, in front of their classmates, of their, um, everything would be thrown out of their backpacks. It was just really, um, it was really discriminatory and we wanted to make sure we got rid of that. So we did last June. Um, and then we also decided, well, we need to ban pepper spray. There is school police officers on our campus who have the ability to use pepper spray on our black students. Um, and so after different incidents where 12 different incidents were um, reported across um, LAUSD, we said enough is enough. And it's time that, we, that these school police officers on our campus should not be able to use pepper spray. Um, and so then um, in 2019, we also uh, met with the superintendent to make sure that was um, finalized that no school police officer will be able to use pepper spray on children. Um, and so then 2020, as of last year, we created a list of 10 demands that dealt with a passage of all classes. So these students are dealing with this transition of coming from uh, on campus to virtually literally just changed everything in a day. We were just going one minute we're at school and then the next minute it's like, hey, well actually you're going to be at home for a while. Um, initially it was supposed to be for two weeks and now we see we're on at home for a year. So we wanted to make sure these students had like passages of all classes at this time. Um, safe graduation ceremony. So when we are able to return back to campus, that the seniors from last year and maybe even this year are able to retur um, return and have that graduation ceremony since they were not able to um, because of the pandemic as well as police and ice free um, food distribution centers. So LAUSD offers a, um, food distribution centers at various middle schools and high schools, as well as at elementary schools, where you can pick up uh, a free lunch or breakfast. However, a lot of them were being over-policed, and some people were in fear, um, undocumented students as, and families were 
right? Because there were ICE showing up to dis these distribution centers and we wanted to put us into that because no one should be worried about, you know, um, policing at the time when they're just trying to get support. Um, as well as cancellation of rent and evictions, immediate housing and health care, and have loved ones released from prisons and detention centers. So we did win a passage on some of these. Um, however, some of them, not always. Um, so then our most recent victory is the one that I'm so excited to be a part of, is our uh, current fight for, to defund the LA School Police, which um, LAUSD, um, back in June, divested $25 million from the LA School Police Department to invest in resources for black students. $25 million was the largest cut ever made to the school police and the police chief as well as 30 other officers resigned the day after. Um, so this was a big victory for us because I'll talk more about what it means to defund the school police. But um, this campaign started after we did our ended random searches campaign. That was kind of our our steps stepping stone to be able to defund the school police because we said, well, here's this racist policy that is continuing to criminalize black students. But however, there's multiple things on many campuses that um, criminalize black students. There's these, like I said, like pepper spray, there's, um, and then we're talking about criminalization, the school to prison pipeline, we're talking about um, the, the school police officers in general. So that's how this all kind of funnels into one. Um, so this is just an example of, of the button campaign. So we gave out over 8,000, 8, 80,000, sorry, buttons um, for the end run of searches campaign back in 2018. So this is an example of one of them that was designed by a student. So um, many people were describing how they would be on a bus and they would look to the person next to them and they would have that same button and that they knew that this movement was moving across LAUSD and that people understood that it is time that we stop policing and criminalizing our black students. Um, so, this year, um, well, last, sorry, last year, um, but the recent uprisings of BLM with uh, Breonna Taylor, George Floyd, Nina Pop, Ahmed Aubrey, so many names that we could name. Um, there was this call to action to defund the police. And people were like, what? Defund the police? It was such this big and radical term that so many people were just like, what does that mean? Um, and so we wanted to, we as students deserve knew that we had already made that ground um, for what we wanted to do. And it was long, it was long before um, even 2020 that we had talked about eventually getting rid of the school police. Um, and what would that look like? And so it was perfect because defund the police, this national call from Black Lives Matter. And that's part of our coalition. Black Lives Matter LA is part of our coalition, Black Lives Matter in general colors um and so we wanted to make sure that you know we included some form of that call into our movement so we said instead of defunding the police we would defund the school police because that's where our black students are targeted the most is on school campuses um so this is this is um one of the events outside of the school board um where many are, um, we we end every one of our um, rallies or meetings with a Sada chant, um, which I'll talk about a little bit more later. Um, but so this is everybody in collaboration with that. Um, so why does this even matter? So this is a report that was from the Million Dollar Hoods re report um, by the, conducted by UCLA researchers. And so this shows what we are talking about. Um, so we see that in ver various communities like South Central and Southgate, um, that students are being over-policed more than their population. Um, and so um, one thing that this doesn't show is that we have statistics from also from this project is that 8% um, of the population of LAUSD is black students. But however, 25% is arrest, diversions, and citations. So black students are most likely to come in contact with the school to prison pipeline, as we know. They're being over-policed more than their population in their school district, which the school is where, you know, some go to get away from their home life and go to, to just forget about everything else that may be going on. Um, 
And so one, and then we also saw one in four youth arrests that were made by the school police were in elementary and middle school age children. So think about that. Um, students that are going to school starting elementary and middle school not only have police on their schools, but now are being currently targeted for arresting um, just for them being a child doing uh, things such as, well, I mean, come on, we all did some things as a kid that we might regret now, or that simply we just didn't know about. But now these kids are being policed because of that. There's, that's the start of their criminal record. Um, and that's the start of their perception of uh, police officers as well as safety within their community. Um, so as I said, our ongoing fight is to defund the school police. So as I said, I'm talking about a radical perspective. Most people don't understand what that means. Um, and so when we say we want to fight to defund school police, it means we're fighting for police free schools. Um, so as I said, we joined that call of defunding the police with our organization that includes Black Lives Matter LA and 70 plus org, um, orgs. And so we were able to get that divestment back in June of 25 million after fighting and showing up to the school board and rallying and doing all that we can um, to make sure that they understood our voices. Um, and we were saying to, dive, to defund the $77 million that we spend on school police. So LAUSD spends $77 million on school police, but yet there are still communities that are black and brown um, that have schools that are left with uh, um, updated, uh, I mean, uh, current like poor stated um, textbooks. They aren't updated. Some of them don't have textbooks. We don't have technology access. And during this time, this is very crucial. So we said we need to invest resources into our black and brown students. We're spending so much money for them to be criminalized on campuses. Why not switch that funding over to support um, which ties back to restorative justice. So we wanted to reinvest into these services that they need. So we talked to students, we were like, what services do you need, especially black students? Um, you go to these campuses and a lot of what we heard is, we have a school police officer on our campus, but we don't even have a counselor. Um, we don't have a full-time nurse. If I get hurt and it's not a Tuesday, then I better be lucky because there, there's no access for me to get um, healthcare or help support. And so, um, and then some of them also said, well, um, I, I want a grief counselor at my school. A lot of us are struggling, especially during this pandemic um, of losing loved ones and we have no one to talk to about that. Um, mental health counselors, um, students, you know, are still constantly struggling, especially in this day of age, trying to keep up with everything, keep their grades up, making sure that they're doing the best that they can, but we're also not robots. And so we continue to keep going, but we don't have no one to talk to us about what does it mean to uh, do some mindfulness, do some self-care, um, really focus on yourself. And so this is where we said, well, this is what these students have asked for. Now let's make sure that they get it. Um, so currently we are working with the superintendent to make sure that this $25 million that was divested is going into these support services for black students. So yes, their education matters, but it's also them as a being matters, their individual matters. Um, you use our statistics to get money for your school district. However, you're not listening to our voices when we speak up. So it was time that we did, and that's what we have been doing. Um, and so this is uh, also from our June 30th rally. Um, this is just me speaking. This was actually my first protest and somebody just gave me a bullhorn and was like, go get the crowd's attention. And I'm just like, huh? What? I've never done this before. This is my first time. And so uh, soon after, like, yeah, everybody started, I grabbed that bullhorn and everybody started listening. And I was like, I knew this time as a black student was my time to speak up and also for my fellow peers to speak up. Um, so we, it kind of got shadowed out, but we did a, a aerial photo of people standing in human letters of defund LASPD. So in case you don't get what that means, we also showed it to you. So. Um, we know you can read, so we made it clear um, clear what we wanted um, that day, and that was to defund the school police. 
And so I really want to want to um, reflect on this because I say this a lot, um, but I want you to understand this. As I said, this is a radical theme. But just because something is not normal doesn't mean it is not okay. That doesn't mean it is okay. Slavery was normalized, prisons are normalized, and all sorts of other inhumane practices are, main, are made to seem rational and necessary. But that doesn't mean that they are. And so that is exactly what it means when we say um, defund the police or defund the school police, because there, we know that black and brown people have suffered so much over the past years and black people have been fighting for to even get the right to walk um, without feeling like a target. But yet we still have incidences to this day and age where people are being killed for walking down the street, for being in their own home, for jogging, uh, for going to get Skittles at a local liquor store. So it's time that we start looking at these, these practices that have been instilled. Yes, police are implemented in this institution that we already know is racist. Where did, this, where did police officers come from? They started as uh, slave catchers, and now they're just a form of modern day slave catching, as well as prisons and the prison industrial complex. Um, so yes, it's not normal when you hear defund the police, because it's like, what? The, who is gonna protect us if we don't have police officers? Or who's gonna protect our students if we don't have police officers on our campus? But the thing is, is every day and age that you um, have those police officers in your community or on your school campus, uh, black students are being, being criminalized more and more, and they don't get that opportunity to persevere in the future. Um, and it's rare that we see that. Um, and it's more than just about statistics. It's about the fact that no, we're not taught to contradict societal natural values or traditions. We know that everybody says when you're taught as a little kid, you're taught um, when there's an emergency, you call 911. But also black people are taught when they're young, the, the speech about what happens if you get pulled over by a police officer, if you have interactions with a police officer. And you know, there's so many viral videos going around about people and lawyers that are speaking up and they're like, what to do when you're pulled over by a police officer? What to do when you're engaging with a police officer? But we know that's not how it varies for everyone. It varies different, uh, very differently for black people. Um, and if you make it out of that situation alive, you're very lucky. Um, and so that's what I mean to change your perspective of what you think about things. Yes, you're not taught to contradict society. And when you do, oftentimes you're shut down. But is that okay? No. And do you agree that slavery was okay? Do you agree that the Jim Crow laws were okay? That prisons are okay? All these inhumane practices that really affect Black people. It's time that we start shifting our view. So when we talk about what does safety look like, instead of saying, hey, let's call someone that could possibly police the person even more, especially Black people, even anything when it comes from mental health crisis to an actual crime, we can look at that and say, well, what do, what does it look like they actually need? Do these communities even have the resources that they can, that they need to stop them from being involved with uh, police officers um, and so many different things? Um, do these students have enough resources on their campuses, on their school district? And that is something that we're not seeing. And so that's why we're saying, we're calling for this radical term. Um, so yeah, this is back to our action back in June. Everybody standing out in this, and it goes farther down the hill. Um, but this was just, for me, so powerful because this was one of my first protests. And I just looked into the crowd and I'm just like, people are actually showing up and people actually believe in this. Um, and so as Pascal was saying earlier, like when you see um, those headlines about advocacy and when you see um, when you see all these people show up and are contacting you and you realize that you're doing good for your not only your community, but for yourself, for many people, you know um, that like you you have that great feeling. Um, and so, yes, it might be scary at first. Yes, it might not be something that we easily introduced but it's also something that we know can and, you know, will work. Um, so, um, yeah, so 
when we talk about making Black Lives Matter in schools, that's what it means for us um, to make sure that, you know, students aren't being criminalized when they go onto campuses. Um, and so with that, um, uh, let me stop this share. Um, but yeah, so I just wanted to like reflect back on that, um, to that idea that yes, this may be a radical term, but we also want to continue uh, to look at different perspectives within society. And it is, it is okay to sometimes contradict what this nation sees as true values, because we know that when that constitution was first written, and we know that when um, the Pledge of Allegiance was written, we say, uh, freedom and justice for all. Are we really talking about for all? Um, so that's all I have for today. Um, students Deserve is on Instagram at LA underscore Students Deserve and Black Lives Matter as well, BLMLA Youth on Instagram. Um, so definitely look us up. I'll also, um, yeah, share that. Um, but yeah, that's my presentation. <laughs> Kalila, thank you so much. Um, I want to commend you on taking on such a sort of big um, movement and topic um, at your age. Um, you know, I think when you're saying these are radical, these are radical sort of perspectives and ideas, I completely agree with you. You know, I think um, there's this sort of confusion, right, that that surveillance somehow equals safety. And, you know, the black experience is proof that that is not the case, right? Um, I think there's a comment um, in the chat. I want to ask the student to, to read it and then we can um, go to some questions for you. Yeah, sure. Um, first of all, I want to say thank you for the presentation. I think um, we don't have enough conversations about high school experiences and like policing in schools. And the comment that I wrote um, says that they make it seem as if random bag checks, mantle detectors, police, etc., at school are necessary during our education, but they don't give us nurses, um, adequate counseling, or Black Indigenous people of color and queer teachers, which results in um, a big hole in our education. And I think that that is something that isn't normal and frankly, it never should be. Right. Um, and also like to touch base on that a little bit more. Um, we also see that, you know, of course, everyone is scared of what could happen in society. And so a lot of times what I see within this movement is when we say uh, get school police officers on campus, everybody's like, are the main thing is, if there's a school shooting, what would we do? And when we look at that, uh, we look at the data from school shootings, and we look at um, all like um, all these different things that have been um, implemented since uh, school mass shootings were on the rise, um, and we see that that increased police officers, that increased zero tolerance policies, that increased uh, metal detectors and security and surveillance and all of this. Um, but in these areas where school shootings occurred, it was predominantly white, mm -hmm. predominantly white, wealthier areas. However, the communities that are being over police are black and brown communities, especially black communities. These communities where they already don't have enough resources, where they're already being policed by police officers, now have police officers on their campus, now have all these surveillance policies on their campuses and uh, all these criminalization uh, tactics. And so when we look at that, yes, we know that school shootings have happened, but they don't happen in our neighborhoods. Mm. And we're the ones that are left without the resources that could prevent that from ever happening. But yet in the communities that actually, um, the communities that are getting resources, student, like it isn't being recognized. It isn't being talked about. Um, it doesn't get talked about that in the Parkland shooting, the officer ran off campus. And when it came to a jury um, uh, facing him with criminal charges, they said, well, he's not guilty because his job description says he's supposed to protect the property, not the students. So technically, his, he did his job. So 
who's to say that if there's a school shooting on our campus, that that police officer will protect us? Yeah. Who's to say if there is something that to happen on our campus, that that person will even be there? Who's to say that that black student won't be further criminalized on the day that their life is in fear? Um, and we can look at those different policies and we can look at the different things that are in place and we can say, well, what can we do to prepare ourselves if there is an incident like that? How are we prepared? Yes, we talk about, well, if there's a school shooting, you know, maybe hide somewhere and like go on lockdown. But are we really talking to everyone? Because I've seen these videos all across social media where it's like, what to do if there's ever a mass shooting on your campus? Um, and, you know, there's all these tactics that these teachers go over. And yes, the kids are scared at that moment. The black students are being taught that because we face bullets walking out of our house. We face that trigger. We face those emotions. So really, that's nothing new for us. But we aren't being taught to not be scared of that. Instead, we're being taught that, you know, it could happen and we're going to continue to criminalize you until it happens. But what that's also saying is let's continue to normalize a society that is anti-Black. Let's continue to normalize curriculum that is anti-Black, where you go to a school and you're not even taught about your culture and your heritage, where you go to a school and then you're further being criminalized by an officer who you've seen multiple times, maybe watching over you, or you've seen um, all these continuous history lessons where you're taught the white version. You're not taught these, um, you're not taught about radical figures. You sure not. Um, and so that's what we we're, when we're talking about also when we talk about these policies when we're talking about getting rid of like police and um, all these surveillance policies it's, it's also like we need to stop fundling systems that continue to be anti-black mm -hmm. because we know that um, black black individuals in general face so many fears throughout society and this is one of them um, and so. Also, like when we look towards this, we also have to recognize that students are there for an education and that is something that we're not providing them in black communities. Mm -hmm. um, and then for them to be policed, what are we really saying? If you're increasing criminalization and policing, and when we talk about our experiences and we go to school board meetings and you're saying we're over exaggerating and we're outsiders and we don't read, we don't, we re, we're so young, we don't know what we're talking about. What you're saying though is that you're not going to do nothing about it until you see our name on a headstone. Because you don't think to that possibility and many others haven't. Minneapolis didn't disband their contract with the school police until after George Floyd. And so, and we see that in um, Oakland too. It wasn't until a black student was beaten so bad that they were in the hospital and that we said, well, why do we have these police officers on campus? Instead of thinking about it when it gets to that point, we need to start thinking about it now. Is it gonna take for my family to mourn over to my 17 year old body to the fact that you actually start to think of this radical idea? Mm -hmm. Kalila, that being said, I, I have a couple questions for you, um, you know, about your experience. You know, um, I'm wondering what your experience has been like coming up in the movement. You know, you said you went to your first protest last year. I'm wondering who are the key people um, in supporting your insights and your involvement with the, the Black Lives Matter movement? Yeah, I mean, sure enough, it was actually one of my teachers who, like, uh, when we first went on virtual learning, who contacted me, um, and she con she's like best friends with my BSU advisor. Um, both are white teachers. My BSU advisor is a white lady, but she, she's she been the only one at my school to support me. Mm -hmm. Because uh, in support, when we talked about starting a BSU, because when I was asked um, people at my school, can we start a Black City Union? Uh, aren't you reading To Kill a Mockingbird in class for Black History Month? As if To Kill a Mockingbird was all about our history. Um, and sure enough, I looked and I was just like, wow. Uh, and so then I got some Black students at my school together and we were like, that's not what we're gonna do. Um, so we started our Black Student Union and it's going on three years strong. And um, so I'm happy to say that I'm one of those founders 
but also I know that who I have support in my corner. And I found that through one of my students, um, I mean, one of my teachers, and maybe she was white, but she was also there. And, you know, we also know how to include um, what that means to be inclusive. Um, and so just because she's the advisor doesn't mean she's speaking up about black history because it's the students that are speaking up about black history and black culture. Um, and so she, her best friend contacted me and was like, hey, I think this organization would be perfect for you. It's called Students Deserve. They're currently working on ending pepper spray. And I'm like, I didn't even know pepper spray was allowed to be used on children. So I'm like, wait, what? And then I'm like, okay, yes. Um, how do I get involved? Like, take me there, let me know. And so I finished, uh, attended my first meeting and then all of a sudden things switched gear and it's just like, oh, well now let's talk about these demands. And then all of a sudden it's like, okay, well, let's switch again. We're talking about school police. And I'm just like, wow, this moves pretty fast. But it was also, it also felt like, you know, it wasn't like, it wasn't something that I felt new to. It was like, that was somewhere where I was meant to be. Um, and so when we like people talk about their call to organizing for me, it was knowing that I didn't know about, uh, being over policed because on, luckily on the campus that I go to, we're not over policed, but that doesn't mean I haven't had an experience with my school police officer. Um, because when I was in 10th grade, um, and I was at a school event and I passed out due to dehydration, I was accused of having a drug overdose. And so um, when I look back at that, like, I'm just like, okay, it's a hot day, been running around. Your first question isn't, have you drank water? No, it's, uh, could this possibly be a drug overdose? And, you know, um, you look like, I look back to that and I really say that I, I silenced myself from that experience for so long mm -hmm. um, that when I found this organization that was talking about the things that I had been thinking about for years, that I knew that it was meant to be. Um, and so it's, it was because of that teacher who reached out and it's because of this organization who I'm able to now call my family who have been there to support me. Uh, these, these people that I, that have similar experiences or understand, um, that I can truly say like, you know, these are the people that guide me through my work. And they also say your ancestors guide you. Mm -hmm. Um, and so for me, like I grew up with my grandmother who's also white, but she was always the one that was making sure that I knew and understood my culture to the best of her ability. Mm -hmm. And of course she knew that she wasn't, you know, the, pa the platform to always speak for me, but she was always the one that was there and made, made sure that I got to this point, um, especially with everything that I had went through throughout my life. She was always that person. So she's my ancestor that carries me through this movement. Um, and she's that person that continues to guide me. That's so great to hear. Um, I'm sorry that, that that's an experience you've had um, as a student, um, you know, with your, your school police officer. I think um, there's definitely, there's sort of a lot of assumptions made around um, Black students and, and sort of Black people in general, right? And, um, you know, touching on your, your grandmother and sort of your, your ancestors, right? Um, I'm wondering how you see your activism fitting into a legacy of organizers and activists. Well, I know that legacy is a lot to carry because there have been so many people before us that have started um, the stepping stones to our groundwork. Um, and so when I look at that, like my activism, I know that, you know, there's no day and age where you're supposed to start to necessarily organize. And for me, I, I personally say I started late. Um, but at the same time, I had that stepping stone when I was seven years old and I attended my first protest for like budget cuts. Mm -hmm. Um, but I don't really think back to that cause I wasn't, you know, I was seven, mo I was brought there by my grandmother. I really didn't know what I was there for. But when you talk about being put into this work, um, I know that what I'm doing now is truly what I want to do and what I could want to continue to do and will do. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, and so I feel like we learn, we, I know that we learn a lot from our ancestors. Um, 
but I, and I also know that, you know, what works and what doesn't, we learn from their mistakes. We, we learn from their actions. Um, and, you know, a lot of times when I look onto that, you know, they're, I, I, when I look at our ancestors, when we talk about legacy, I don't feel like, you know, because I'm an activist, that there's this certain hierarchy that I'm supposed to reach because of because of Martin Luther King or Malcolm X or um, Harriet Tubman. Like, I, I don't see that, but I know that I can definitely make my mark up to that point or even further if I try, um, which is something that I will do. Um, but I definitely like, you know, there's no obligation because of my ancestors, but I do know that like, that is something that I, you know, will continue to persevere within my future. Um, and like, but I know that my ancestors have started this groundwork and if it wasn't for them, we wouldn't be able to talk about these ideals. Um, and I continue to look back at them and I continue to look um, back at the people who have, you know, that are currently in this work that I can look forward, like, look forth to like Patrice Cullors and um, Janiyah Future Khan and all these other um, activists that are standing out here and people even my age that I can count on. So that's what I'll continue to do. That's great. I want to open the floor um, if some students have questions or comments they'd like to ask Kalila. I guess I'll go. Um, first of all, I'd like to say I'm personally proud of your bravado and the work that you're doing at CGNU. Again, you said you feel like you started late. I was moving to so the perfect time. Um, I guess my question is, with all the things that you identified that you'd like to do, what do you think the institutions as well as honors or higher education, um, what do you think that our contribution to the science could be? Can you repeat the last part of your question? What do you think that the contribution that, what do you think the contributions that we should make as higher education institutions, for example, SIARC should be supplies that are already going on that you're pioneering. I definitely think that, um, so like my movement is defunding the school police, but we know that police aren't just within um, middle schools, middle uh, elementary and high schools, um, that it does go into higher education systems. And so there are lots of different institutions that are looking at ways of reimagining safety for their students, um, especially for their black students. Um, and so there's this uplifting of the movement of looking at how we spend our money, especially in institutions, um, towards policing. Um, and so, like, I'm not familiar too much with how, like, SIARC spends their money. Um, but um, definitely, like, I would say, like, one of those big things is to make sure that, because a lot of institutions spend tuition dollars on um, investing in the um criminalization, uh, policing and criminalization systems, um, whether that's uh, using it for police or the prison industrial complex. Um, so I really call for those organizations to just really look for um, how they spend their money. Um, and is that really the best investment in um, especially education, uh, especially when we talk about tuition dollars, it's like we're paying you to be policed because of our color. Um, and so it's, yeah. Um, and also just looking for, look forth to always to continue to educate yourself. So I love how SIARC offered this uh, week of action um, to talk about this today and the organizers that started this, um, that's amazing. Um, but so many institutions aren't doing that. Um, and they when, they, when we talk about Black History Month, it's really isolated to maybe a day where they, you know, spend time talking about like, uh, who were these, uh, like who are black people, who are these black ancestors? Like, and that's something that, you know, we, we need to look, um, we need to look beyond because just because it's Black History Month doesn't mean that this is the only month we should be celebrating black culture, black heritage, black history. Mm -hmm. 
it's the shortest month of the year, might I say, that um, that doesn't mean that it's our only month because we celebrate our culture and our heritage every month, um, every day of the year. And so I feel like also institutions should be doing that as well. Um, and continuing to educate themselves. You know, you just because you're a professor doesn't mean you ever know too much. Um, a lot of uh, professors now a, a day and age are being called out in class because it's like, well, hold up. Um, let me introduce you to my generation. I'm Gen Z, uh, and we're not going to stand for that. So um, we've been seeing that a lot lately, especially if you're on social media. Um, and I just think, you know, just because you're being contradicted because you know, that's maybe what a 20 year old student and you've been teaching for 20 years doesn't mean you know everything. It doesn't mean that you're involved in every perspective or every um, par uh, paradigm shift. Um, and so it's time to like really look at that as well. Um, so I just encourage, you know, professors and institutions to educate themselves and just really watch how they spend their money and also continue these discussions and open up these spaces um, just like SciArc did today. Thank you very much. Kalila, cool. thank you so much. Um, we really appreciate you sharing with us and um, you know, revving us up, you know, we're all we're all here for for the same thing, right? And that's to sort of uplift and, and celebrate and protect the black experience and black culture. Um, so I wanna thank you. Please keep going. Um, so looking forward to seeing what you do, um, you know, as you finish high school and go um, off to college. Um, hoping that your your um, endeavor to sort of defund um, the LA School Police Department happens. Um, I think that's something that would be, um, you know, really sort of pivotal and um, ne it's definitely necessary. Um, thank you again. Thank you. And speaking to that as well, um, I also encourage your guys' contribution. Uh, so we'll be meeting in February with the school board and we just call that, you know, when we have our actions, students deserve posts on Instagram. We encourage that you share um, on your social media, show up if you can, um, but make sure that these student voices are heard. We're, uh, in February, we're pushing to make sure that this $25 million goes to Black students and Black students only. Um, and then throughout the rest of the school year, we'll be continuing um, to make sure that maybe this year is the year. No, this year will be the year that police um, get off campuses. So um, I just encourage you guys all to, you know, share um, our movement on social media, follow Students Deserve on Instagram at LA underscore Students Deserve. Um, and, cont uh, and continue to um, open up spaces like this. But thank you. Thank you. All right. I would like to introduce our next panelist. Um, David, Mr. Star City White is a Brooklyn-based artist, um, or Brooklyn-born, sorry, artist based in both New York City and Los Angeles. Um, his work has become increasingly recognized for playfully abstract portraits, both real and imagined subjects embodying otherworldly synthesis of beauty, passion, and conflict that define our world. Um, his work was featured in Zendaya's cover shoot for In Style magazine, a project that was done with an all-black creative team. Um, his work also ranges in mediums from painting to sculpture, poetry to music, performance to the moving image. Um, without further ado, I'd like to welcome Mr. Star City. Thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you for having me. How are you all? Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you fine. How's Very glad. Oh, I appreciate you guys for having me. Um, I love the spirit that I'm hearing already coming from you all. You know, I love the, the young lady I just left. She's very special. She's out here putting some work in for our people. And I think we all should challenge ourselves to do the same. You know, I've been using my creative abilities to push forward some type of inspiration and love and compassion for our people in my own way. And I think we all should try to do the same in our own way, you know? And Thank you for having me. I'm Mr. Star City. Thanks Can I hit? Yeah, yeah, there we go. Thanks for being here. So um, 
I guess I have a couple of questions. We could go straight into questions. I wasn't sure if you wanted to share some of your work with us. Um, well, I have a piece here. Yeah, I actually, I bought a piece. I put a piece of, see, I'm in Miami. I'm not even in my studio. I've been working. Oh, okay. Here. Yeah, I've been working here on this. If you could see, like, I'm, I'm, I must just show you. I've been working here. I turned this space here into my studio. Nice. So I've been, I've been out here. I'm just vacationing with my family. And I've, I've been out here just working and meeting the community in Miami and all the museums people and the curators here and I've been just having a good time just trying to build a community everywhere I go just try to get a tribe together to push forth these efforts that I, I have to bring forth with my passion but I do have a piece here this is a, I, I do want to present the piece I'm, I'm gonna start off with the lover boy lover boy is, the, is a series I created over the um, pandemic when it first started um I was stuck in the house uh fasted for 27 days because I didn't know with this coronavirus thing was at the beginning. I was, I was, they was bombarding us with all this news and different ways that it can affect us. So I was trying to figure out how can I defend my own body and um, build up my immune system to be able to fight against this um, new virus that hit us all, you know? So I, I said, you know what? People telling us to steam our face, they like saying, hey, do this, all these weird things. I was like, I don't know about this. But I know one thing is for sure, if I fast, my body will begin to protect itself. So I fasted for 27 days. Mm. No food, only water, herbs, and roots. That's it. I have my CMOS, I have my bladder racks, my sarsaparilla, my sarsaparilla, all of my roots. You know, I'm a big, I'm a big root guy and you know, herb guy. So um I, I did that. And within while I was fasting, I wanted to um create, but when you fast and you 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 when you 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 kind of like low on iron, you know, and yeah. like certain things. But when I bend down I, I, to reach for my tools, I become like a little dizzy. I was like, I can't do this yet, you know. So then I broke my fast, and within breaking my fast, that's when George Floyd got killed. Mm -hmm. And then George Floyd got killed. I still couldn't go out and work on my works. Couldn't stay in the studio because I had to get in the streets with my people and just use my voice to push forth this movement of bringing some justice for this man. Mm -hmm. So after two weeks of being out there on the streets going crazy with my people in New York, um, I came in the house and I just was like, man, I'm exhausted. So I started, I started taking the, some pads and some paint and some ink and I started tracing and, you know, getting to a vibe and I came up with Lover Boy. And Lover Boy is this, this guy right here. This one I created here in Miami. I wanted to be influenced by the by the waters and the sky and like you know just just what I'm seeing around. So this is this is a Lover Boy. Lover Boy is a traveling jazz musician. He's a hopeless romantic. He chose his passion over his love, and that cursed him. So every town he goes into. He ends up falling in love, but he cannot stay in love because he'd rather do his passion than be in love. And that's what people fail to realize. If you and a partner don't share the same passion, say I'm a musician, I like going to the studio. My, my, my The girl that I'm dating or in love with, she loves to stay home and read books. But I'm in the studio, she's at home reading books, but not together on the passion because I'm steady. I'm chasing my passion, she's doing hers. But when you share the same passion, you share the same love. And Lover Boy chose his music, which is his saxophone, over his love. And that, that's why he became first by love. But that's, just, that's another story. That's one of my art pieces right there. That's, that's Lover Boy. Yeah, I actually wanted to sort of touch on um, Lover Boy because it was an exhibition that you did. There's sort of multiple pieces. Um, and, you know, I think a lot of your work touches on um you know emotions and human connection and you know you're either telling these these stories through um paintings or sculptures and um soundscapes and i guess my first question for you is what's the importance of vulnerability for you do you see it as resistance or a form of resilience it's a definitely a form of resilience it's a, it's a, it's, a, it's the opening of all conversation because your vulnerability allows someone else to be truthful and as free with you as you are with them, you know? 
if you're not vulnerable, it's going to cause for some type of restraint and a wall. And in order to just not even place that before you, you just show yourself exactly as you are and as free as you are and as careless for your emotions because that allows each of us to be to care more. You know, because if I care about my emotions, I'm going to think more about how I'm going to feel. And mm -hmm. I think that should not, I think we should all share the same feelings because we have them all. We have the same exact feelings. So there's no reason for me to guard mine when you could, when at some point in time in life, you felt the same way I felt, you know? So I think, yeah, I think being vulnerable is a very essential part of being a human and living the human, the human experience to the fullest. Going Billy is number one. Mm. Well, sort of touching on, on, you know, the black experience, you said, you know, being vulnerable is how you sort of reach, you know, a level of like spiritual freedom or, or emotional freedom. You know, I feel like um, in a lot of spaces, it's hard for black people to be vulnerable and open up. So I'm wondering, like, in your work um, in the imagery that you create, or I guess a better question is, is there imagery that feels like um, love to you? Like, how do you expand that with your community and, and um, the environment? I, I spend it by telling the world, not only the world, everything that I see and touch, I tell it I love it. Mm. Everything that exists, I believe in. So it's like, often this you conversation or hello, or some people may say, um, Star, you always telling people you love them, you always telling people you love them. That, that's what people say to me. You say that to everybody, but I'm like, why not? And why shouldn't we? It's like, a, it's like when I was first born, I was born to two people that love me. Mm. Now, some of us may be missing our mother or maybe our father, but best believe the first person that looks at you loves you, right? And you felt that from the beginning, that energy is already evolving in this all. It's already there, it already exists. So when I meet you, I'm gonna tell all of y'all right now, I love y'all. Like, it's a real thing. Like, there's no reason for me to hate you. I have no reason for that. I only have one purpose in life, and that is to show the love and to give the love. That's all I got to offer, honestly. That's the only thing that comes to my table first. Right. So I think we should all share more of that and we should keep the love moving because there's yeah. enough hate. We have to start combating it with the love. Mm. So I got, I got a question for you about Loverboy, right? This, this character that you've done, um, you know, these incredibly textured paintings of. Um, I highly recommend everyone go look at them on, on IG, um, really to get a sense for, for the sort of materiality. And, and um, you know, I think your technique of painting is very, it's almost, it feels sculptural, right? Um, yeah. You know, and I'm thinking about Loverboy and his, his love, his saxophone. Um, yes. I'm currently teaching a class on jazz and I think, um, or the history Big of in Los Angeles. And so, you know, you're talking about love or choosing love as a way of sort of um, fit, finding like freedom and sort of, you know, feeling free. Um, why, why the saxophone, I guess, is my question, you know, in terms of the character you developed, like, is there like, was that a conscious decision or was that something that you just kind of felt and, and went with? Because I think, um, you know, jazz as a sort of era was big for the black, for black culture. You know, it, it really like, it really sort of highlighted a moment where black culture was started to, like black culture started to be appreciated in a, in a more like public way, you know? Um, yeah, I guess I'm, I just want you to sort of speak more on that. Well, the sex, it was definitely a conscious purpose behind it. The sex is a soulful instrument. It 
the, even the way you have to hold it, it's, it's kind of like a baby also, you know? Mm. The sacks, it, it, and you're right, it's, it's part of our culture, the way you hit it, the way you use your lungs, the way you breathe life into it, you know? I mean, you could say that with all instruments, even with your hands and drums, but it was something about the sax that made me fall in love. And I painted my first sax in LA. Mm. And when I painted the sax, I said, this instrument, I'm gonna paint it for the rest of my life. So, after after Lover Boy, I painted the sax. I was like, yo, I love, I can't, it's it, I don't know how I don't know how to express if you hold your hands up like you holding the sax, it feels comfortable, feel like a hug. Mm. Like literally, it feels like a hug. Like, so I, I just fell in love with the sax. I love the sax. That's it. Like, ain't, uh, ain't too much more politics to it. It's just a beautiful instrument. Yeah, I mean, I agree with you a hundred percent. You know, I think um as a designer, you know, sax as an object even is a beautiful piece, you know? Um, I wanted to talk to you too about your, um, a sort of exhibition you did, um, Voices in My Head at the Watts Empowerment Center. Mm. Um, I'm wondering how do you, so just for some context, for those of you that don't know or aren't familiar with the piece, there's this sort of large, um, sculpture i guess mr star city would you like to talk about it yourself I, I, you know yes 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 all work, right, like. <laughs> all right. The, 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 I, I wish i hope I, I could probably try to show it but the piece is called voices in my head it was from my fracture series the fracture series was based on my brother's life my brother suffered from schizophrenia and ptsd and he developed these things after being shot shot in the street right mm -hmm. he didn't recoup well he became he, he became very aggressive he became um he became paranoid super paranoid and he slipped into schizophrenia mm -hmm. i asked my brother so i, I created this piece it's, it's, a, it's a fabric piece it's a sculpture it's big six feet tall six feet wide it's huge it's full of eyes and mouths and noses and I wanted to express the different characters that my brother go through daily, you know? So some days he's really nice, some days he's really quiet, some days he's really excited, some days he's mean. So I wanted to take all his characters and put them into this one sculpture. Mm -hmm. I was there the night my brother got shot. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to ask my brother, is and so we never spoke about it. So one day I said to my brother, I, said, I, I took my phone and I took another phone and I recorded it while I was talking to him. And I said, I said, Lord, tell me what happened the night you got shot. And he said, what you mean? What, what are you talking about? I said, he said, you were there. I said, I know I was there, but just tell me, tell me what happened. He told me the story. I recorded the story. Mm -hmm. Then I put the recording inside of that big sculpture. Mm -hmm. So when you went up to the sculpture, you heard my brother telling the story about the night he was shot and how the schizophrenia and the PTSD begun. That was the thesis behind the whole piece. The piece was for people to hear voices in his head, the, the things that he felt when he got shot, the story that, that led him to his PTSD, the story that led him to his schizophrenia. That was the, that was the point of the whole piece. It was, that's why it's called Voices in My Head. I wish I could really just put it up. But... So you actually, you use sound um, quite often in, in your work. And I'm, I'm wondering um, in which ways you try to use that to sort of um, extend the effective potential of, of other mediums, right? Whether it's sculpture or painting or, um, you know, a sort of animated um, film. Yeah. I need sound. I need sound because I was a musician. I'm a poet, you know, I'm a writer. And I love to have, I know that component um, brings us more together because you might not really relate with a piece of painting on its own. You might be like someone just into music, you know, like into beats or into words. So I incorporate each of my shows, every piece in my show has a poem that correlates with it. Mm -hmm. From the beginning of my career, I always have poetry that correlates with the works on the wall or the sculpture. Each piece will be aligned from the poem. I read the poem out to you and then I explain each piece to you. 
I never leave my works, ever. Right. When the start show begins, I'm there from the first day of the show to the end of the show because I'm part of the performance art. Me and my art is one thing. Mm -hmm. So I use, I use sound, I use music, I use video, I use any medium I could use to get my point across. Mm -hmm. Any medium. Mm -hmm. And if you into creating, use every single finger, toe, anything you can use, use it to create. I'm telling you that now, it's, it's going to enhance anything you do. Right, I think that's great advice. Um, I definitely agree with you on that. Um, in terms of, you know, sort of making use of, of multiple mediums. Um, I guess I'm wondering in terms of, you know, your technique um, when you're painting or when you're making sculpture, um, whether or not your work is, is or whether or not you, you feel like your work is tapping into, uh, you know, a black vernacular in terms of the craft, in terms of craft traditions, um, you know. Yeah, because I sew a lot. I wanted to say that too. The yeah, whole piece was sewn. It was sewn from the beginning to the end. I sewn the piece for like a month. Mm -hmm. I sat under my duty, moving that machine and stuffing it. Right. Oh, am I still here? There we go. I was yeah, about to say, what happened? Thank you, Alex, for right there. pulling this up. <laughs> this is an incredible piece. Um, you know, That's my love. as um, an artist myself, you know, the work, your work really speaks to me. This idea of sort of um, these faces being like mul having multiple parts and, and kind of being like re rearranged and, and reorganized. Um, you know, I'm wondering. Um, this technique of yours, the sort of abstraction of faces, um, whether or not you're um, you're trying, or whether or not the individual that that or the subject that you're um, portraying is ever um, a sort of discrete individual, or is it like the like you were saying, you know, this piece is about your brother and sort of all of his feelings, but your other portraits, you know. Um, even the Lover Boy series, you know, that 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 portrait's made up of, you know, a bunch of sort of patches of color that construct the whole. You know what I mean? Like are right. those meant are those meant to represent um one person or are they the sort of multi are the sort of multiple facets of a person or are they multiple people at the same time? It's it's all of us. Like mm -hmm. I never paint from just one experience, but I paint I paint from my experience, but for all of us. When I said earlier that we all share the same emotions, and we, we all share, basically we're not too far from each other, whether man or woman, boy or girl, white or black. Mm -hmm. We're all one thing. So this is, these are, if you notice, the hands are not black. Mm -hmm. If you look, the hands are not just black. <laughs> right. this, is, this is anyone, this is anybody. I'm speaking to the world and, and with my words. Mm -hmm. I'm, not I'm not staring it towards just the African American experience. I'm sharing it to the human experience. I want to live the human experience to the most highest. Mm -hmm. And I want others to follow me on that journey because I think that we all should stop, stop separating each other and allow us to be one thing. Mm -hmm. And that's a human. Mm -hmm. I know it sounds cliche as hell, but yes, let's get as simplified as we can because we it's too complicated right now. Right. You know, we went from praise. Look, just think about the the way we praise God. Mm -hmm. I believe in God. Mm -hmm. I believe in anything that exists. If you believe in it, I have to believe in it because it's true to you. How can I say it's not real? Am I right or wrong? Right. So I'm saying if we make everything complicated, just just make it just make this just be on one one. Just let's have one focusness, and that's just love each other because we are all one thing. Right, right. Um, you know, I think you mentioned you mentioned um, the previous piece being about your sort of brother's um, experience with. Um, trauma and PTSD and, and schizophrenia. I'm, I'm wondering how the rest of your work or, or your sort of practice lends itself to a, a form of like therapy. You know, I think in the black community, there's- um, Big bless. 
<laughs> Let me tell you something. I got something for you. This is, my, this is my new series right here. This is called When We Bloom. Mm, when We Bloom. Yes. Yes. That's stunning. And wow. It's about us giving our flowers to the men. It's, I'm trying to get rid of this masculine. Mm. Um, look at this, baby. Look at this, baby. The textures you're able to create on a canvas are incredible. So I'm trying wow. to get rid of the masculine toxicity. I'm trying to say that we can all the men, the men, us, us men, us men, we can give each other flowers. Mm. We can hug each other, we can love each other, we can be there for each other. We don't have to be the toughest, the gangsters. We can also be like, yo, I love you, and that's it. I don't, I, I, I'm not trying to stop. Right, right. This is my new, one of my next series. It's called When We Bloom. Looking it's forward to seeing the rest of them. Yeah. I'm working on these here in Miami, but it's about us giving the flowers to our people while they're alive, respecting mm -hmm. each other, having patience and appreciation and compassion for one another, you know? It's not, when I was young, let me tell you, I was 12 years old, I wanted to ride a skateboard, I'm in my hood. I'm from Brownsville, I'm from Bed-Stuy, I'm from East New York, I'm from New York for real. I'm not, this not a fake New York guy. You can go to New York, you can say my name and ask about me, it's real like that. Mm -hmm. But I'm trying to say, I try to ride my skateboard at 12, 11 years old, and the older dudes is like, man, get that shit out of here. What the hell wrong with you, boy? Nobody around no skateboard around here. Basically shitted on me. And then I, I couldn't develop those skills that I see the kids have now. I've been shunned away from actually just living a free life because people wanted to portray this image and make me portray the same image so I could do the same thing you did and perpetrate the same lifestyle you live. I, don't, I didn't want to do that. Art freed me from all of that. I ain't gonna lie to you. I was really outside for real. I'm not like there's no fronting in me. I, I I came from I this rose really came from the concrete. I really you can ask about how what type of man I was. I'm the most I you know you watch a caterpillar turn into that butterfly. Mm. I have my wings. I have my wings. Um, I think. I think there's a question from a student. Shifago, I'm gonna, Shifazo, sorry. I'm gonna ask you to read your question for Mr. Star City. Hello. Um, I have a question um, that your work, um, I think it was the one that you showed earlier, that it was trying to portray what you felt brother was experiencing during his um, schizophrenic episodes. What I was wondering is whether it sort of ties back to the question that was asked earlier. Whether in working through art, you were trying to understand what he was going through, or you were trying to relay to other people what he was going through. Both. Not only that, I wanted to show people that in togetherness, you can heal anything. Do you know my brother no longer suffers from schizophrenia? Do you know my brother no longer suffers from PTSD? Do you wanna know why my brother don't? Because my family took the time to have patience, to have the empathy that we needed to understand him. This, there was a 20 something year journey to get this man to a clear mind. It wasn't overnight. It was my mother taking turns, my father taking turns, my aunts, uncles, me. I got 19 brothers and sisters. We all fought for my brother. He's the oldest. That was our leader. We fought for him so hard, cleared his gut out, had him fasting, doing anything we can. That boy talked like this now, regular. Back when with his with his daughter hanging out with his daughter doing his doing his job going on regular he was street tough anything you can think about that kid did we saved my brother by being together 
and working together to make this man back, bring our brother back to the way he was. And you can do it. And yes, this journey took me through all those stages. We have. Well, that's a beautiful story. Thank you for sharing it with us. Thank you for listening, my love. We got another question um, from a student chatting in on live stream. Um, our test that impressive. Could you share some specific resources, literature, or any format for community building? Thank you. I think community building is like, I don't even, like when they come to community building, I use, I use life to do that. Honestly, like I would never say, hey, go online, look at this. I would say, go outside, put your tribe together, and allow your tribe to move with you forward. And y'all put, y'all get together and, 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 and say this, put bullet points together what y'all want to do. You, you can start a, you can start a tribe with just three people that can lead the 20. Like literally everywhere I go, state to state, I build just like this. I will, I, I'm not going to leave none of y'all. If y'all open my email at the end of this, y'all can hit me up, whatever. We will all be friends forever. I promise you that. I would never leave none of y'all ever, ever. I'm the, I'm the one friend that texts you and say, I love you. Like out of nowhere, I'm that guy. Literally, if you want to build a tribe or put a community together, you get outside, you shake hands, you tell people you love them and mean it, and then you bring them home with you. That's what you do. You bring them home because home is here. All right. Right. Home is here. We got a comment um, from faculty member John Cooper it says, "Thank you to Mr. Star City for Big your life. site specific." public installation on Oxford Street here in London, featuring love. Yeah. It lights up the city. Yeah. <laughs> I was so excited when that happened too. I was like, oh man, I'm being on Oxford Street. You know, we're in this pandemic, we can't even travel. Mm. You know, luckily I'm here in Miami, it's open. I keep telling everybody, wherever you at, just come to Miami. You know, <laughs> you get some space between yourself, you get the, no, listen, this is very self-care for me. I wake up, I run the beach, literally, run, run, run. So I just came from my hair still wet. I ran up here. I was like, oh, I forgot I have the thing. I have to go, I have to go take care of my business. I ran the beach, I jump in the ocean, as hot as, hot as I could get myself, jump in the ocean and my cells start going crazy. <laughs> my cells, inside, ah, I get out that water. It's therapeutic, you need time to take away from just, this, this, everything can't be a, a, a chase, a race. It can't be that all the time. Sometimes you gotta take some time to slow down and reflect. We all need that inner energy, that inner voice, that inner sound. We have to hear our heartbeat. We have to hear our lungs breathe. Because we listen to too much outside. It's, it's distracting to our sync with the universe. We're not there. We do not even there, even in prayer. And I'm not saying you got to pray to God. I'm saying pray to yourself. Give yourself some words of encouragement. Give yourself the boost you need. It's not about outside reflections on you. It's about your inner reflection, and you give that to others. That's the truth. That's what lies first. You. Because that love you have for yourself is the only love you got to share. You got to build that up so you can pour this, pour it out. Well, how, how much, if you don't got nothing, what you giving? You're not giving nobody nothing. That's dry air. Go in here, pour it out. We got another question from a student. Go ahead. Well, first of all, uh, I can't tell you how much I appreciate all this energy, all the love. I mean, that's just, it, it feels like it feels like home, like that's what, the, a lot of the way you're speaking, that's how I was raised. You know, that's where I come from. Um, so my question to you is, how do you deal with trying to translate this to, you know, like there's young brothers that just don't get this, you know, um, outside of, you know, answers like patience and empathy, um, you know, especially given your, your field as an artist, where you just deal with people's um, egos and, and, and self um, reflections and the way that they project that onto the world. How do you try to uh, engage 
Um, when you recognize that just being yourself doesn't necessarily work in the environment that you're trying to exist within. Mm, you know what? That's not the environment I want to be included in. If I can't be myself, I don't got time for that type of energy. It's not for me and it's not for you. That's for sure. Because the people that's dealing with that, that's what they want to deal with. And when you feel any type of way that just makes you feel discomforted, you get away from it because life is not about that. Life is about happy. I'm telling you, listen, perspective is the only thing. I see people down all the time talking about all this, they're complaining. That's what you see. If you got to be in the middle of something that's not allowing you to be the beautifulest thing you could be, that place is not for you. I promise you that. Get out of there as fast as you can. Get out of there. I don't deal with places like that, brother. That's that's also the answer. I was yeah. That's one of those too. I've heard that before. Yeah. So yeah, that works. Don't get, <laughs> Just get out. Yeah. I don't want to. I don't want to do that. It's too much. It's too much. I love you. You ain't got to do that. You know, I, I wanted, Anybody else? Oh, I wanted to ask one more, and then um, I guess we can check the chat, and um, if any other students want to chime in. Um, you know, I think sort of going back to Tunde's question about how you relate this to other people. I feel like you do that through your work and in your sort of storytelling. And I'm, as I'm wondering, is there a, a folklore or a counter origin story that you're developing or tapping into? As a, what, for what series? No, for just, what in series? Your work in, just in your work in general. Like this. Ask me it again one more time. Okay, Sorry. is there a folklore or counter origin story that you're developing or you're trying to tap into? No, there's not. I'm just I, listen. I wasn't trained as a um, artist. You know, I didn't go to school for this. Mm -hmm. um, I'm an outsider, so this is all from my just experience, and I think that's what separates me from the artists that are creating now within this 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 new. African movement, this African and African American movement. The reason why I'm standing out the most at this point is because I'm using my life experience to put forth my art. And a lot of artists are like guys who like look on, they could paint very well. I'm not knocking nobody, but they're excellent painters, but they have no life experience. So they find the things online, uh, like Instagram photos, and they repaint that. I don't, I, don't I, I can't do that. I'm not saying I can't paint that. I'm just saying I can't do that because I have so much to talk about. <laughs> it's not going to be just a painting on the wall you're looking at. I have a lot to say. Like, I can't wait till my next show in New York. I swear, I'm going to have so much to say. I already wrote the poem. I already started the first two pieces off of it. I didn't see it yet, but I can't wait to show it. And um, it's going to be amazing. And if you follow me, follow me on Instagram and follow this journey. And, you know, it's, 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 it's worth it because I use Instagram as a therapeutic place for me, you know, and to help heal people and take some of that fog away from you. You know, I, I help people focus, 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 focus on what's good, focus on what's good. Focus. So I keep pushing that, you know. So follow me on Instagram if you end up a little... I'm going to put your ass in line. Get, get focused. Everything is good. Don't worry about it. You got this. Don't worry. Yeah, that just being said, like, your Instagram account is just, like, the best vibes and, like, gives me so much, like, energy all the time. And it's just, uh, it's, um, I'm really thankful for, for that platform. And, like, to have you here talking to us today is even more amazing. And it's just, it's just really great. And I love your work and I can't wait to see more of um, the When We Bloom series because the texture of that is just crazy and the way that it comes off of the canvas. I'm just really excited and uh, thank you so much for being here. I really appreciate you being here for us. Thank you for having me, A. I appreciate you so much, man. So much. I really do. Man. I'm here for y'all. Anybody need me? Any advice? Um, any type of guidance, anything you need me for, just 
just hit me up. You know, if you don't have my Instagram, you you should have it by the end of this. And if you want to send me a DM, you need to talk about something. You know, people come to me for all types of advice, and all, I, I'm I'm just here to help. You know, I'm here to be a God and light. There's a lot of darkness going on, and we need we need people like us in this world. We need to create more people like us, like me, in this world. We need to create these people. You know, so I'm here for you all. If anybody need me, I'm one call away or one DM. Very blessed. I wanted to ask a question. Uh, thank you, by the way. This this whole talk with you, I think you're so spiritually spiritually connected, and um, you know, I haven't had anyone tell me like to love myself in a while, so it's pretty oh, good. Oh man, let me see um, your eyes, man. <laughs> Yeah, it's time, brother. It's time, brother. Big bless. <laughs> and I wanted to ask, um, when you said that you were an outsider to the art world, what does that mean to you? And I don't know, I feel like in the art world, um, terms like that kind of make special people. And I wanted to ask you what that meant to you as being an outsider and how that affects you or your work? Oh, I didn't create that category for artists, you know, so, but I hold it high because um, I didn't, I couldn't afford school, you know, I didn't, I never went through the school and I couldn't go to college, you know, as I told you before, I was raised at a different time where people were shining a lot of things, even if you was, even if you were too smart, they're like, get out of here you trying to teach knowledge over here you know it's like you and for my coaches like even i i, I was the top i was the top student in my classes forever but my but the neighborhood i lived in my coach they taught me to dumb down and like be outside and not care about school it was weird it was wicked for me man you know and i had to i had to relearn to love myself how about that brother that's what really happened the same way I'm telling you now, the reason I'm saying that, don't ever stop. I had to relearn to love and appreciate my wisdom, my knowledge, and my understanding. I had to relearn to appreciate myself as a spiritual person. I had to relearn to appreciate myself, appreciate myself as someone that's loving and giving instead of taking and hating, you know? These things you had, these things that I was taught and, and bombarded with, I had to take uncover that dirt for me, bro. Mm -hmm. and lift myself back up man for real being an outsider to me is very special because i it allows me to say all right i didn't go that way but i still i still accomplished the same things you accomplished i'm on a war with nina chanel i'm on a war with Amoko. you hear me these are top artists in the world i came from the street i share the same space as them because I didn't deny myself. I didn't doubt myself. I didn't give myself the, the burdens of saying, I can't do it. I said, no, I knocked on everybody's door. I rung everybody's bell. And I told them, listen, I'm a nice guy. I need to be in here too. And they listened to me, man. They let me in, bro. They let me in. And back to you when you was asking me about community and building community, listen, man, you, you, you allow people to love you. You allow your love to love people and they will just, it, it, it'll form, man. It's not, it's no, it's no, it's no magic to it. And even, let me tell you, brother, when they, when you walk into a room and the room don't feel comfortable, you make the room comfortable. And if you can't make it comfortable, that's when you leave. But when I come in there and my smile is there and my heart is big and I'm strong and I feel good and confident, they all fall in line. There's no way around it. And if you don't fall in line, that means you're more conflict and I'm leaving. That's it. Because if I enter with love and you come to me with hate, I'm leaving. That's it. Outsiders, whatever. Inside or whatever, we all together. That's it. Big it's all about reciprocation. That's yes, right. <laughs> perspective. Perspective is huge, y'all. I'm telling you. Gather all the blessings. Open up your arms today. Open up your heart today because the universe is grand. Just throwing them along. 
And if your heart is closed and your eyes ain't open, your hands ain't you're not receiving nothing. Put them up, open up, and it's received. Take it all in. Mr. Star City, thank you so much. Um, thank you for your energy. Thank you for sharing your work with us. Um, you know, I think that's this is like the perfect way to sort of end the first day of Black Lives Matter um, week exactly. here at SciArc, you know. Um, the message is love. The message is yes. confidence. Um, right. The message is vulnerability, right? Yes. Um, accepting everyone as they are for who they are. So I want to thank That's you right. again. Um, yeah, we really appreciate you coming out um, and, and spending some time with us. I also want to thank our other panelists, Pascal Sablan, Kalila Williams. Um, we appreciate all of you. And um, we look forward to, you know, continuing the dialogue, continuing the conversation and, and you know, growing this community. Let's stay friends. Let's stay yeah. loving. Let's stay appreciating each other. Let's all continue to do the right thing. All right. Yeah. Let's look inside. Let's bring forth that love outside. Let's do it the right way this time. Yeah. People are, they distract us. Don't let them distract you. Keep fighting on, sister. I see you. Keep fighting on. I see you down there, wherever, if you're over here. But you keep fighting on. Let's do the right thing. I love you all, and I appreciate y'all. Big bless. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks everyone that's tuning in via live stream. Um, we appreciate you guys. Um, and please come back for day two tomorrow. Um, give me one second, let me pull up the schedule. I will tell you what we're talking about tomorrow. Um, tomorrow we have, sorry y'all. Um, okay, tomorrow we're talking about diversity, globalism, and collective value. Um, I'm looking forward to it, and I hope you all are too, and yeah. Thanks everyone, thanks everyone for being here.